big bars. Hello, we have a successful connection. Oh, yeah, here we are. Okay. All right, great. I can see you. I can hear you. Let's go ahead and test that screen share. Okay. So at the top of the screen, like right above your face on your video feed, you should see a, an icon that looks like a laptop with an arrow on it. So go ahead and just hit that. Uh, where is that now? Uh, if you hover your mouse over your face, it should appear right above the top of your head. Oh, yes. Uh, screen share. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm screen sharing. Yes. And then you can just go ahead and bring up your slides. Okay. Let's see here. So, um... So let me go, I can go into, I can go into, uh, so I've gone into presentation mode now. Do you and see it looks me, great. Do you see me changing the slides? I do. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so let's see. So how shall, how shall I, what, what how do I do this? Uh, do I just stay where I am and then I'll share the screen after Nuno is done talking? Yep, that'll be it. Uh, so Anton's going to give a little introduction, and then Nuna's going to introduce you, and then you will go ahead and screen share. Okay. And how do I stop screen sharing for now? Uh, you hit the X at the top of your browser window. And I can also do it for you. Top of my browser window. Oh, okay, great. Okay, yeah, right th there. thanks a lot, Caitlin. Okay. Yeah. So yep. I'm going to go ahead and take you back off video because uh, then you don't have to hang out on video stream for the next 20 minutes. Fantastic. Um, and we'll bring you back up at the beginning of the session. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye.
Good morning. I can see you. Do you want to do a mic test? Can you, yeah, can you hear me? I, yes, I can see you, I can hear you, and I can see your screen. Perfect. Now, let me, do you see my slides? Yes. Okay. I just, I wanted to test the video. Uh, yeah. No, that's, okay. that's good. That's why we're here early. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yep, you're all set. See you later. Hello, I can see you. You want to go ahead and do a mic test? Yes. I can hear you. Fantastic. And you can see my PowerPoint. So I cannot see your PowerPoint. I can see you. Me. So how do I go to, sorry, where is the option to go to share my screen, not my face? Yeah, if you hover over your face, there should be a little toolbar that pops up right above you. One of the icons is uh, looks like a laptop. Yep. Just go ahead and click that. Okay. 
So I can share entire screen or application window. Let me share the entire screen. That's usually the easiest. All right, and I do see your screen. You do see my screen, but how do I go now? Because I have a window on top, which is over here. Right. Here, now can you see the presentation? I can't. Okay, sounds great. All right. Great. So if you go back to the Crowdcast window and click the X at the top of the browser like screen area, that'll take you out of screen share, or you can just speak up and I can take you out of screen share. So here. And then um, up at the top, there's an X. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, all right. And You're all set. Close, and here, close video. Yep. All right, we're going to get started again in just a few minutes. Uh, right at the top of the hour, that's 8 o'clock here on Pacific Time. Uh, any speakers who are here, if you want to test your video, screen share, audio, et cetera, please speak up, and uh, we will bring you up for a test. Speak up in the chat. I can't hear you.
Good morning. You want to do a quick mic test? Hello, sure. Sounds great. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Quick mic test? Good morning. Great. Can hear you. All right, we're gonna get started in just a few minutes here. We've got some instructions up on screen about uh, how to use that chat and Q&A panel. So we'll have this chat open the whole time. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you can have conversation with all the attendees, general commentary, share your thoughts about how the talk is related to your research, anything else like that. But all of your questions should go into the question panel. That's down at the bottom of your screen. You should see a button that says, ask a question. So you can ask questions there for the present speaker or previous speakers, and just please make sure to address the speaker in your question, such as saying, Anton, and here's my question. That'll help make sure that we can identify what speaker each question goes to because those questions won't go away at the end of each talk. That also means that when uh, your talk is over, speakers can be answering questions by using the comment button so every question can get answered today.
All right, Anton, you want to go ahead with the intro? Yes, thank you, Caitlin. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. Hello. Good morning for those of us on the Pacific Coast, and um, hello for everyone else. Um, welcome to the workshop uh, titled Open Data Tools and Models from the Allen Institute, Supporting Systematic Computational Studies in Neuroscience. So I'm Anton Arzipov, uh, an associate investigator at the Allen Institute in Seattle. And it's my honor and privilege to organize this workshop with two more investigators from Allen Institute, Taskia De Vries and Nuno De Costa. Um, we have an exciting program covering the next three days, today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Each day we will start at 8 a.m. Pacific time and go until noon and um, a few words about what we'd like to achieve here. So the Allen Institute uh, has accumulated a large array of public resources containing data on various aspects of brain structure and activity, uh, mostly focusing on the mouse as an animal model, but also even some data on human. Uh, these resources, th there are many resources, and uh, for example, they include uh, data sets that contain transcriptomic, electrophysiological and morphological information from neurons. Uh, they contain data on ultrastructural connectivity or synaptic physiology for the local circuit in, in a cortical area or mesoscale connectivity in the whole brain. Um, we have databases with um, neural activity recorded in vivo um, using calcium uh, imaging or massive electrophysiological recordings with the neuropixel probes. So lots and lots of data are very high quality and highly complex. And they are freely available online. So we wanted to describe the different types of data we have uh, and different um, uh, applications in computational neuroscience that we at the Allen Institute and others in the community are pursuing using this data and tools we develop. And uh, this is a lot to dig into and a lot to discover using analysis, models, and theories with this data. So um, many of the speakers in this workshop are from the Allen Institute, but we also have a good number of speakers from other institutions who are using our data tools or models and uh, making amazing progress in their fields. So let us learn together and make this a great and exciting event. Uh, we hope that this workshop will help uh, many more people in the community uh, to leverage our data and tools to make sense of the brain and its mechanisms and to turn information about the brain into knowledge of how it works. So before we begin, I would like to thank my fellow co-organizers, Saskia and Nuno, all the speakers, uh, and the CNS volunteers who helped to run this conference. Also, thanks to you, all the attendees. And special thanks to the Allen Institute communications team, Caitlin and others in the team who worked very, very hard to put together this workshop. So, uh, shout out to them. Okay, so on each day, one of us, Saskia, Nuna or I, will uh, moderate the session with the help from the communications team. And today, Nuno, who is already on the screen, will run the show. So let's welcome Nuno. Uh, he's an investigator at the Allen Institute working on electron microscopy reconstructions of large neuronal circuits in the cortical tissue. And Nuno will introduce our first speaker of the day. Thank you and enjoy the workshop. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Anton mentioned, I'm uh, Nuno Masarico da Costa. I'm an assistant investigator here at the Allen Institute. And the sessions of today and tomorrow are going to be about the theme of neuronal cell types. Um, today, we're going to focus. Um, we're going to focus about on the um, on the, um, the molecular expression of these neuronal cell types, and also on how these um, cell types project across different areas. Of, of the cortex, we have um, we have a, a a few people from the Allen Institute, but also we have two two external speakers that I've used um, 
both the molecular expression data and the inter-aerial connectivity for their for their own research. And, and we're going to start with um, uh, Michael Orlitz, um, who is an investigator at the Allen Institute. Um, and he has a PhD in uh, applied mathematics from the MIT, and it has been with the Institute since 2003, and he has been um, highly involved in in directing the direction of um, the data analysis and and the tools that uh, that we share um so um uh, michael i i leave it on to you one one final notice that, so each speaker has 30 minutes if there are questions of understanding i'll interrupt to 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 pose those questions but um i'll try to to um to leave most of the questions to the end so that the um, so that the speakers can 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 follow with their with their train of thought Okay, Michael, it's 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 on to you. Looks like Mike is loading. So he'll be just a moment. Maybe while Mike is loading, one one other notice. Um, you you you'll see the questions that are being posed, and um, if if there are questions there that you like, uh, yeah, please vote on them because they'll come up on the list, and then I'll I'll that will be part of um, how I would select questions to um, to, to pose to Michael and speaker. Good morning, Michael. Hello, hello, Neil. Uh Okay, let me go into my sharing mode here. Sharing screen. Um, okay, uh, you can see my screen now. Yes. Um, okay, I guess in, in, a, in an actual meeting, one never had to ask that question before. <laughs> um, anyway, thanks to Anton and Nuno and Saskia for organizing this really nice event. Um, and it's my sort of pleasure and, and privilege to have a chance to speak to you today about the, uh, uh, sort of what's some of the things that we're doing. I just chose to kind of, given the three-day nature of this event and all these interesting presentations, largely I've just decided to, uh, in some sense, give an overview of, of my perspective on some of the things. And I'll refer to some of the presentations uh, just th uh, sort of indirectly, at least, uh, uh, so that to give you a bit of a preview of what's coming. In, in, in essence, uh, a lot of our work um, has been centered around this sort of mission in the last 10 years or so, or really kind of trying to understand uh, the, the cell types, the nature of cell types, their quantitative description and characterization. And we, we have uh, earlier in many pre, pre, in years earlier, whereas we, we largely just took a type of transcriptomic approach in, uh, in more recent, more recent years, we've added, um, a lot of the more other mod essential modalities to really understanding uh, kind of the nature of, of, of cell types. Um, the goal has been to get data di driven classifications, to uh, build genetic tools to sort of allow the access and manipulation of these types, and to understand uh, some aspects of their of their function where possible. Whoops, excuse me. Let me go back. Uh, so the, 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 the approach has been to bring uh, kind of, as I said, oftentimes using it as genetic tools as a kind of prior to uh, condition on, on uh, types of cell, cell types that are, are, are expressed uh, essentially, and to use that as a way of sort of sifting through to get a kind of a deeper characterization. Um, what, what really kind of a key aspects of this have been a kind of multimodal type recording. So in, as in patch seek, where you actually patch a cell, a record from its physiology while it's intact, um, then essentially uh, take out its, its sort of DNA to profile and uh, do morphological reconstructions. Um, uh, you, and we'll hear, we'll hear definitely a lot of progress in these throughout the, th the three days. Uh, finally, there's been a kind of large scale kind of uh, long range, the understanding of long range projections, as well as, uh, as Nuno will talk about an exciting kind of EM uh, kind um, look at the really deep uh, mi microstructure of, uh, of cells and, and uh, for, forest as well. Classically, cell type classification, you know, going back to Cajal and, and, and 
other people of, of, of over 100 years ago had, been, of course, been done largely through uh, kind of uh, the stru structural views into the characteristics of cell types. And, and it is, is absolutely clear that, that the structure, that, that the sort of physical structure of these types and, and trees, for example, as described uh, through the work of Giorgio Ascoli, uh, is really representative of of different different types, yet yet there is a challenge in in for in making in associations between uh, other modalities which are really observable in the data, and so we we seek paradigms that allow us to kind of make cross comparisons and understand this. Transcriptomics provides uh, a very powerful way of, 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 of doing this. Um, it is not the, the only word, but it is a very, a very uh, uh, important kind of quantitative approach to uh, being able to sift through and to categorize data. And so we've been taking this largely, this approach, as I said, based on, uh, oftentimes based on uh, Cree type uh, characterizations in the mouse and through other viral type methods in, in the human. To do these uh, profiles, and, I, and you'll hear a little bit, uh, I think, in the next talk um, from Basil Katazik of uh, a lot of her work on um, major characterizations in uh, the mouse uh, uh, cortex. Um, and so we've also been able to, we've approached this also in multiple species as well um, through uh, this sort of recent consortium efforts through this of uh, the brain initiative. We've been al aligning, in fact, uh, data sets across human um, and, and mouse and even multi-species with m macaque. Um, there are challenges in this. Uh, it, it is not where, where this is this is icon down here from a from a paper from our original human atlas paper of 2012 in which we observed these uh, cortical gradients um, uh, of gene expression across the brain and that you could actually reconstruct the cortex based on positioning of the samples. Now these were taken, these were, these were at the time kind of uh, meso-extracted samples from, from the brain. And uh, it would be easy to look at this and say, well, um, uh, these, these gradients that we see, in fact, are uh, they're, they're because of this sort of sampling effects, right? Um, and that you hadn't really looked at a cell type level. But in fact, it, quite surprisingly, we, we, we now see these sort of gradients and, and, and this uh, sort of undiscreteness, if you will, uh, at a cell type level. Um, whereas there are groupings of cells which are uh, apparently um, more identifiable than others and, and, and un, unequivocally reproduced across species. Um, that there are also kind of ambiguities and, and, and cells that don't assign well. And, and we seek methods, for example, as some of the ones I've enumerated here, of, uh, of ways of, of putting quantitative evidence to these and, and to making sense of these. Um, one approach I've been working on recently with some colleagues uh, from uh, Yusu Wang and Parthamitra is, I, I think, a very, very promising avenue to looking at this. Is that it, it comes from methods of which are increasingly uh, applied now of topological data analysis, and in particular, the applications of sort of what, what's called discrete Morse theory. Um, basically, the idea is that we wish to regard this, we, 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 we wish ra rather than doing dimension reduction methods sort of ab initio, we wish to regard the gene expression land as, as a really multi-dimensional landscape where, for example, we might observe a par valbumin peak here or Mount SST over here, but, but we, 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 we keep in the analysis directly all the, this multi-dimensional landscape and, and gradients. And then we can study essentially the, the, the topological properties that, that are preserved or persistent under different sort of thresholdings, if you will, in this Morse graph structure. The graph itself is constructed by correlation of, uh, or, or, or by a simplicial decomposition of gene expression. But to give you an example, that, that this seems to work pretty well, and I hope to, to talk more about this in, in other kind of venues. But here's an example of, of, a, of one of our major clusters of inhibitory neurons from uh, the, the Tazic 2018 paper. And so here what we're doing is that we actually show 
ra rather than a, a type of dimension reduction, this is the actual one dimensional landscape of mountain ridges and sort of arets connecting these. And if I go back and, and I color these by subclasses which were identified from the, this, uh, this uh, Tazic et al. characterization, I see a, a very nice sort of coherent assignment. Not, these colorings are not random at all. But I also do see that these cell types or putative types, they, they border and abut up on, on each other in this landscape. And in fact, if we go to these kind of confusion matrices, in essence, which were, which were uh, designed to explain that, I can see that these relationships of proximity are, are, are actually captured in this graphical structure here. So this is an interesting approach. We'll, 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 we will be kind of uh, going into more later. Uh, later. But uh, a big issue of this is nomenclature. How do we name these types? How do we come up with types that are, are of meaning to uh, uh, people and, and uh, make sense? Um, we, and also, it's, it, whoops, and also it's, it's not sufficient um, to uh, just simply to study and to classify these, but we wish to understand the meaning. In, in some in, in work involving Stephen Smith and colleagues Uyghur Sumbul here at the Institute, we've looked at these uh, kind of uh, neuropeptides, an like ancient class of molecules uh, that, that go back that are essentially uh, uh, in, in all metazoans, a type of pre, if you will, pre-neural kind of communication network and, and studied the, sort of the communication networks of these across cells. Uh, this Using machine learning methods, we can sort of dissect these uh, and kind of uh, essentially try to understand what the what what these kind of types uh, t t tell us about the organization of the transcriptome. Like as I said, we've done alignments across human and mouse of these transcriptomes, and we found uh, a good homology. Uh, essentially, uh, below essentially below the subclass level, below these major classes of uh, a, an assignment. This is this is kind of a very interesting work. It's it's it's, it's really a, a type, if you will, a type of uh, cell type uh, analog to homology mappings of the genome. Right, uh, er, you know, in in earlier years, of course, we mapped genomes to each other by seeking out sort of sequence alignments and, and using sort of string matching and other sort of, uh, you know, the sequence homology methods to align genomes. And now we can begin to allow, align taxonomies, if you will, of cell types, which is, is quite exciting. Um, we've been bringing, as I said, we've been bringing into prayer these sort of physiology and morphology, and we'll hear uh, nice discussions of that, work about that uh, from uh, Tim Jarsky, from Stacy. Um, from other uh, Stacey Sorensen, um, and we'll, we'll hear about this sort of th this large approach of understanding the physiology of the brain through this brain initiative, a fantastic project, which uh, several of the talks are are, are devoted to. Um, it's been a, it's essential to sort of connect, as I said, these phenotypes and this this method of we call, which is called patch seek that now at the institute we've really been able to get a really kind of uh, ro reasonably robust pipelines to do what we call MET or morphology, electrophysiology, and transcriptomic simultaneous recordings uh, of the types. Uh, this gives, in, a, in fact, really very strong morphological kind of constructions, which we, we can use to sort of, sort of really kind of dissect the positioning and layer laminar structure of these cells and where they project to. The work of Stacy, I think she'll be speaking about this. Um, and we also there's the problem of uh, uh, this problem of of aligning these types across uh, across physiology, across uh, morphology, and and aligning them with our transcriptomic profiling. Um, uh, a nice kind of researcher in in a, in our group, Rohan Gala, working with Uyghur Sumbul, has devised these methods of these type of coupled autoencoders which enables us to sort of a type of competitive kind of autoencoder uh, uh, implementation, which allows us to, 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 to basically to, to simultaneously reconstruct the, the, the kind of the, the cell type structure of the transcriptome and, and the physiology. And this gives some of the best alignments of these, which in an otherwise quite subtle uh, kind of correspondence. 
This allows us to map data, we the map data to this new uh, common coordinate framework, this uh, work of Lydia Ning, who you'll hear about. I think she'll be talking about, uh, she'll be talking later, perhaps I think maybe tomorrow about uh, this, this new atlas of, of, uh, of sort of mapping, which has been really playing a big part in our brain initiative activities. We can map this long range data in this way, get really quite a quality kind of implementation. Um, Stefan will be talking more about mesoscale kind of organization and, and cortical circuitry uh, and hierarchical organizations. Um, and Anton will be talking about his very nice work with uh, uh, Dr. Billet on a, a really kind of a very, very, very large scale uh, sort of simulation using biophysically realistic models in the visual cortex. Um, and then our, this microns project, which Nuno will be speaking to, which as I said, was this deep ele electron microscopy uh, application to really kind of parse out and dissect the microstructure of cell types. And Forrest, Forrest Coleman will speak about that as well. Um, to sort of type, f finish up this kind of overview here, um, Many consortiums are now active in terms of uh, kind of the profiling and trying to understand the, this basic cell types and their function in the brain. Uh, there's the human brain map of the NIH. There's the, the brain initiative cell census network, which we're part of at the Allen Institute. Um, and also the human cell atlas, which is ex trying to extend this to profile cell types across uh, other organs uh, in, in the body. Um, this Brain Initiative Cell Census Network uh, is, is a consortium of about now up to about 20 different laboratories, uh, some international, uh, apply, bringing essentially to bear all the different kind of app, uh, sort of basically techniques uh, to, uh, to profiling cell types and their, and their function in the brain, including so epigenomics, transcriptomics, morphology, other imaging methods, and, and uh, spatial transcriptomics. Uh, if you will. Uh, we're involved in that here. We have sort of the data center. We work uh, intimately with the data center with Lydia uh, Carol Thompson from the Allen Institute and several different major archives to kind of to store this data and to build ways to access and profile it. Um, very soon, uh, some pr a big sequence of papers will be released in which all the methods of this consortium have been brought to bear to profile the cell types uh, in the in the primary motor uh, uh, cor cortex, so you'll be seeing those hopefully coming out uh, pretty soon. Um, finally, I'd like to sort of just uh, make make a kind of a bit of a promotional pitch for the to these concept of knowledge graphs in terms of understanding. I think that I always have this sort of uh, 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 amusing sort of feeling that. Whereas I do feel sometimes if, if we were to understand the brain, that it would, pro, it, it would I, I do believe I, that there would be possible to have a, a sort of an informatics or computational implementation of it. I often am less convinced that we can develop the infrastructure to get there. Um, uh, reason being that we're always sort of, we're chasing experimental approaches. There's always new directions. And I think we need new and creative ways to understand the uh, informatics uh, sort of of the brain. These knowledge graph structures provide ways of essentially understanding our current state of data and mining them for future discovery. So that being said, I'd like to thank everyone at the Allen Institute team. I, ho I hope we will we'll hear some fantastic presentations over the next few days. And also thank our, our founder who so generously um, uh, supplied uh, the, the, our impetus and, and our vision and our financing for all our endeavors. Thank you very much. Two questions on your on your topological topological analysis. If if. Have you compared the the result of that landscape across different areas, or or across your kind of uh, across species in your evolutionary kind of analysis that you also that you also mentioned? In fact, yes. We, in fact, uh, we've actually done more or less the entire kind of uh, Kazakh two thousand eighteen ontology, and we've also done an uh, an alignment uh, with the 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 human single nuclear data. Um, 
this is sort of a work in progress. It's not fully developed yet. These are some preliminary ideas, but uh, I look forward to speaking about that um, sometime, sometime soon. And and one other question related to that, um, in your in your in your slide with lamp five, uh, in that three, some of the colors were kind of mixed as you as you as you mentioned. Um, do other modalities besides gene expression change the the like the, the landscape that you see, or they they basically keep that uh, landscape? Fixed? Well, that's a very good question. Um, one. So this is the, the, my, my hope and my thought of this method is not, I mean, not, no method provides the last word on, on, on everything. It, 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 what we're trying to achieve here is so complex that, that it's, it's difficult to imagine any kind of uh, essentially approach completely modeling. But what I like about this approach is it provides a kind of data structure scaffold for understanding the relationship of these types and their gradients which is not based on dimension reduction, but in fact works in, in the ambient space. Um, the hope would, and so when you see this mixing, th this mixing in fact is probably cells which are, are not, they represent cells which were actually are ambiguous in the data and were not well perhaps labeled, if you will. The, 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 it, the, well, the interesting thing about your point is that it would be very interesting to see that associated modalities that we see, for example, morphology and others, that they, they share, for example, similar mixing effects. And I think that's something that we would want to look into. But yeah, it's a good point. And, and one, one final question. Um, you, you show that knowledge graph that tries to interpret the data. Do, do you... Um, that kind of has been kind of collected. Do you have any thoughts on how that knowledge graph can actually direct the acquisition of, uh, of in, instead of just kind of ex, ex, trying to explain the data, uh, point a direction where new, 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 new data can be collected? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think that, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a matter of how, how much, um, you know uh, how, how well it's done, but the thought is—I mean, you think take for example, I, I you always use this analogy of, of, for example, PubMed, right? Is that in uh, PubMed for you know it, it it has served us very very well, but it almost becomes a kind of a it, it's a it's a very much after the fact documentation of of, of what is known, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's difficult to assimilate from it. Uh, uh, really, what is known? We, you, you, if anything, it's more of a documentation engine than it is a, 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 a research driving engine. And, and the hope would be that if we could combine more uh, data exemplars of our results, um, sort of to, coupled with the statements of the results and our understanding, then I think that we, we could use such data mining uh, approaches to really, uh, and for example, consider in the, in the perspective of cell types, in, the, in this knowledge graph context, you, you, you could uh, inquire whether new data that you had really uh, produced was provided evidence of a new type or not, or any other type of field that, that, or any other you know, type of thing. I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a, if you will, a pipe dream in some ways, but I, I think it provides an, an interesting vision toward a new way of looking at things. But. Okay, well, thanks so much, Mike, and thanks for the introduction. Um, Definitely makes my life easier as well for the introducing the rest of the of the people presenting. And the next one is uh, Basilica, which uh, uh, I think is uh, is 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 preparing. And um, and uh, uh, Basilica is um, is originally a, um, a biochemist and molecular biologist. He, he got uh, <clears throat> her, her PhD from Harvard, and he has been at the Institute since 2011, and has, has been one of the, the leads in the, um, in, the, in the molecular characterization of, um, of, of, of cell types. Um, um, and Hello, Basilica, good morning. Hi. <laughs> so, Basilica, are you ready to... Well, I can try. I don't. I, I hope my Mac is up to date in a reasonable <laughs> state so that I can actually share my um, presentation. Uh, so let me let me go to um, 
the presentation. Um, okay, here it is. So screen sharing, how do I do that? If you if you wave your cursor above your your um, your your image on the screen, there'll be on the top uh, a, a kind a, a icon that looks like a computer. It's is oh, to yeah, the right of the, the green okay. one that says HD. And uh, mm -hmm. if you press that, uh, things should work. Okay. Yep. Yep. Nice. Okay. Let's see. Okay, do you see the right thing? I, I do see the right thing. There's a there's a fixed image of me on 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 your presentation that I don't think is intended. Yeah. I will close it. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Basilica. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to talk about um, some of the resources that Allen Institute uh, produces. I will focus specifically on how we are trying to define cell types in the mouse cortex by uh, using molecular techniques and then build tools for genetic access. And I would like to start with acknowledging the people that um, have uh, participated in, in this work and in many aspects led this work. Uh, there are three different teams, um, mouse transcriptomics, mouse genetic tools and human genetic tools, the cell type definition was largely led by Zijin Yao, Tuk, Nguyen, and Cindy Val Veldhoven, and the data has been produced by Kim Smith. While the genetic tools, both mouse and human, have, have been generated by two teams um, participating um, in these teams are Tanya, Lucas, Shenchen, John Mitch, Boas, and uh, Jonathan. And of course, all this uh, has uh, occurred under really superb leadership of our cell types program by Hong Kui Zeng and Adeline and generous, um, uh, generous support from the NIH, especially the Brain Initiative. I feel very fortunate to work at the Allen Institute where team science is uh, not only preached, but also um, highly supported in practice. And not only am I highlighting these people, but I would also like to mention that we have received support from many of the core uh, teams and uh, facilities. So cell types program at the Allen Institute um, started about 10 years ago. And really the key uh, goal is to establish a comprehensive parts list of the brain to characterize and define cells based on genes they express, their shapes, their electrical properties, their connectivity, and their function within circuits. Then the idea is to use these measurements to organize cells into unimodal taxonomy. So based on one type of measurement, I will specifically be talking about transcriptomics and epigenomics in this talk and how these particular measurements and information gained can be used to build a genetic tools for experimental access to those same cell types. We would also like to establish correspondence between different types of characteristics to derive a multimodal taxonomy and uh, Mike has mentioned these um, in the previous talk. I won't talk much about those. We would like to investigate conservation of taxonomies across species. And finally, in order to actually ask what is the function of cell type in behavior or in an organism, we would like to build genetic tools uh, for access to these specific cell types. All of our data is available at um, our website and uh, tools uh, are deposited to public repositories. Of all these different types of measurements, I will focus on single cell molecular measurements, genome-wide molecular measurements. Why? Well, in the past couple of years, there's really been a revolution of single cell genomics techniques, and they have proven to be very powerful for several reasons. They're high throughput, the features are defined, genes and numerous and the order of tens of thousands. These approaches are universal. You can define building blocks of any multicellular system as long as you have the genome sequenced and somewhat annotated. And then these measurements, if paired with another measurement, for example, measurement of electrophysiological properties or morphology, can be used as a Rosetta Stone, as a translator between different types of data sets. For example, if you have a data set where you have transcriptomics and morphology, and another data set where you have transcriptomics and electrophysiology, you can imagine you could 
uh, make connections between electrophysiology and morphology. Finally, these data sets uh, not only provide taxonomies, meaning relatedness among cell types and definition of these cell types, but also hypotheses for cell type function and ability to create genetic tools to label and perturb these cell types in an ultimate goal to understand cell type function. And I'm here just highlighting numerous studies uh, that have um, that have been published. Uh, this is a seriously outdated slide, uh, but even three years ago, it just uh, uh, shows the wealth of information that single cell genomics has been able uh, to generate on mouse and human brain. Our approach to single cell, uh, one can also do single nucleus RNA sequencing, um, is the following. We take tissue, uh, fresh tissue from mice. We dissect particular regions uh, of the brain of interest. And then we isolate these individual cells in order to be able to measure uh, expression of individual uh, genes in them. We usually isolate single cells either in individual wells, or we actually perform facts to uh, collect all cells of a particular type, maybe labeled by a transgene. And then we submit these cells to biochemical reactions to profile RNA, all RNAs in a cell, they're reverse transcribed, cDNA is amplified, tagmented, meaning fragmented with addition of tags, and then is sequenced using next generation sequencing. Um, this approach does not have to be performed in single individual wells, but there are higher throughput methods that don't have maybe as high gene detection, but have a tremendously higher throughput, and they're droplet based. Once we have isolated these cells and profiled them. And what I'm, the, the way I would like to uh, represent this profiling is by giving these cells these different colors. Their colors depend on the number and the type of genes and the level of expression of genes um, in individual cells. Then we would like to use these transcriptome similarities to define groups of cells that have shared gene expression but we would also like to define the relatedness of these groups of cells to each other in what we call a taxonomy. And the simplest way to represent a taxonomy is a tree. Um, however, as I would like to um, emphasize, this is really the most simplistic um, representation of the cell type um, of the cell type landscape, and uh, we use this and other ways to represent the cell type landscape uh, in our research. This cell classification based on single cell RNA-seq uh, generates a taxonomy. And as I've mentioned, this is just the same tree just represented in a, in a, in a different way, flat tree. Um, we have so far focused our profiling on cortex. And I would just like to give you uh, a glimpse of what this type of data provides. For example, in our paper published in 2018, we have profiled two different regions of the cortex, anterior lateral motor cortex and primary visual cortex, located at different poles of the cortex in an anterior posterior direction. We have profiled 23,000 cells uh, and we have defined based on uh, single cell transcriptomics measurement as subsequent computational analysis and clustering, 133 clusters. Then after defining these clusters, we have asked how related are these clusters to each other? And we have generated a taxonomy. What a taxonomy gives us are not only groups of cells that share a particular gene expression signature, but also as I mentioned, relatedness of cells um, in a hierarchical fashion. We define groups of cells uh, top down as classes. If they are, for example, a large group of cells that share a common marker, for example, a GAD2 or GAD1, this is a GAP and we define them as GABAergic neurons versus glutamatergic neurons versus non-neuronal cells. As we go deeper down the tree, and each one of the branches here is a single cell type, we can define finer and finer differences in gene expression. So for example, here you can see a pan-neuronal gene, thi one expressed in all neurons. You can see GAT2 as a marker expressed in GABAergic neurons. Um, somatostatin, ex uh, 
a gene expressed in a subclass of inhibitory neurons and a specific gene, chordal chondrolactin, expressed in only a single type of a somatostatin cells. These genes are basically um, not only means for classification, but also allows, as I will subsequently mention, the ways to build genetic tools to access these specific cell types. And as I've mentioned, we don't only use one way to represent these taxonomies. Trees are simplistic. They represent the dominant relationships between types. We also represent them using graphs where a particular cell type here represented by a disk um, is enabled to have multiple neighbors. Um, and these neighbors are defined through these edges in a graph. One can also represent individual cells in a reduced um, dimensions. Uh, for example, uh, using TSNE or UMAP. And here, individual cells are colored according to their uh, cluster um, identity. It is very important to note that these different representations, um, none of them is um, truly uh, what, we, what we can ascertain is uh, the ground truth, but we use all of them interchangeably to gain um, as good of an understanding of both discreteness and continuity of cell type landscape within a particular region. I would like to mention that we have now with the funding of NIH expanded our interrogation to the whole mouse brain. I will just highlight here the current um, study that is uh, has been submitted to BioArchive, led by uh, Zijin Yao, uh, where we have defined taxonomy across the whole cortex and hippocampus. And as you can see, uh, the ability to navigate these complex taxonomies gets more and more complicated. Here, we have defined 379 types from isocortex and hippocampal formation. And in fact, we have used two different transcriptomics platforms. So here is the taxonomy tree. The, the motifs are similar as in our previous um, uh, studies. GABAergic neurons separate from glutamatergic, and they all separate from non-neuronal cells. But we find some um, new features, for example, that hippocampal neurons, labeled here in green, uh, particularly segregate from cortical, and not only within glutamatergic types, but also within the GABAergic types. We have also examined uh, these cell types, again, sampled from all these different regions of the cortex using these different representations. And um, I won't have time to go into details. Suffice to say that the landscape is complicated. There are overlaps of continua and discreteness. And we particularly like to use these so-called constellation diagrams that allow individual types represented here as disks to have multiple neighbors and to include in a way both discreteness and continuity in the representation of this of this um, landscape. I would like to transition to a particular area of interest for me that I think is a really essential if we want to understand what these cell types do in the brain and understand how a brain function um, is generated by interaction of these different uh, cell types. We have had a very rich history at the Allen Institute generating transgenic mice. Transgenic mice that label particular groups of cells. These groups of cells are frequently not individual types, but they are related classes based on uh, gene expression. The advantage of uh, transgenic mice is that they're stable. Um, meaning a uh, gene expression pattern in these transgenic mice is uh, repeatable from animal to animal. However, the tool itself is integrated in the mouse, in the mouse genome, and therefore sharing these tools is difficult. Uh, it's not as convenient. We have generated probably more than 100 uh, different lines, and all our mice are publicly available in JAKS. However, a game changer, I would say, recently in ability to build tools and to distribute them comes from utilization of adeno-associated virus vectors. So imagine if you didn't have to build a transgenic mouse, but you could actually build a reagent that you can then deliver to an animal, and that reagent would label a specific uh, 
groups of cells, either a class or a type. And I would like to go into a little bit more detail on recent studies, uh, two uh, posted on bioarchive and, and currently in a review, um, Gray Button Daigle and Mitch uh, et al. Um, that focus on defining regulatory elements in the genome that can be used to build these new types of tools. So as I mentioned before, um, these tools have in fact been really enabled by our ability to sequence all mRNAs or open chromatin regions within individual cells and then do use these features to cluster cells into types. Uh, I'm just repeating the previous slide saying that using single cell RNA-seq, we can define taxonomies, we can get the genes, and then not only can we do this, but we can in fact do this in different organisms. So for example, we were able to profile cortical cells in human and cortical cells in mice and define corresponding classes of cells, sometimes even to the level of individual types. And that really begs the question, can we make tools that can work across species that can allow us to interrogate these cell types and their function? For this, um, in order to um, be put into reality, what is really essential is not only to generate single cell RNA-seq, but to also generate single cell attack-seq. This approach uh, relies very similarly to single cell or single nucleus isolation, but then does not profile um, mRNAs in cells, but profiles open chromatin regions. Why is this important? These chromatin accessibility regions, in fact, correspond to putative regulatory elements that can be taken out of the genome, amplified, placed into adeno-associated vectors, and used as, um, as tools. And we have, in fact, generated data sets for both mouse and human cortex based on this single-cell attack seek. What you can see is that the data can be used very similarly to single cell transcriptomics to cluster cells based on their chromatin accessibility um, uh, similarities. And although the resolution is not as high as in transcriptomics, it is still quite impressive. Uh, we define many uh, classes that we can then correlate with single cell transcriptomics and assign their transcriptomic identity. So for example, you can see here all the excitatory uh, subclasses in uh, uh, cool colors, all the inhibitory ones in uh, warm colors. And we see that both for mouse and for human. What would we like to do with these data? Well, apart from understanding what is the regulatory code, code that builds these cells, we're very interested in building tools. To build these tools, one prioritizes a cell subclass or type of interest, for example, layer five uh, pyramidal tract subclass. Then we find genomic regions that are specifically accessible, sometimes next to marker genes, sometimes conserved. We clone them into recombinant adeno-associated virus uh, genomes. And then we produce and screen viruses. We use a particular serotype that can be delivered to the brain through retroorbital infections. These retroorbital infections deliver the virus into the brain through injections into um, uh, circulation um, uh, that is predominantly um, available in the, in the mouse brain. And then we look at the expression of these, of these um, uh, tools in the mouse brain, or in fact, we can also do this in slices, in human or um, uh, macaque slices. I won't have time to go into details uh, about these different tools, but I would just like to mention that we have really a series of very exciting tools that work uh, across species. And here I will highlight just a couple of them. For example, um, layer five pyramidal tract neurons in the cortex are subcortically projecting neurons. We found a number of regulatory, putative regulatory elements that are highly um, accessible only in this particular subclass of cells. We performed what I'm outlining here on the right, um, and we examined the specificity and completeness of labeling for this particular um, 
uh, cell type. It is really remarkable that with some of the tools we find more than 90% specificity, when these viruses are delivered to a mouse, we can see high enrichment of layer five um, uh, cells in the cortex. Moreover, when we profile them transcriptomically, we see that the majority of cells are not any layer five, but specifically layer five pyramidal tract types. Um, completeness leaves um, uh, leaves some improvements uh, to be to be made. Uh, this retroorbital delivery um, is not as efficient and, for example, direct injection into uh, the brain, but it does infect the whole brain. And in this particular case, the completeness is only thirty percent. All the specificity is very high the completeness is relatively low. This completeness can be improved by direct injection into the brain. Here I'm highlighting an experiment that was performed in non-human primates in the uh, macaque brain with direct stereotaxic delivery of uh, different um, enhancer viruses targeting parvalbumin inhibitory types. Um, again, we went through a similar process but we tested these both in vivo and in vitro and across species. And here, uh, specificity for pavlovian cells was evaluated later using single molecule fish. And specificity ranges from um, 86 to 95%, and completeness is also uh, much improved, 63 to 92%. We've got about 10 minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, these tools do not exist in isolation. They can also be combined with our previously existing tools and with new tools that are specifically made to be able to multiplex uh, labeling of different types. I would just like to highlight one of these tools that when three different viruses with three different specificities are delivered to the mouse brain and combined with this new uh, mouse line, AI213, one can label not one, but three different uh, subclasses of cells, um, GABAergic, layer five pyramidal tract, and layer five um, intratelencephalic, so cortical cortically projecting cells in a single animal. Uh, one can imagine that there are multiple experiments one can perform on what would be um, a transgenic animal uh, that would have to have six transgenes. In this case, it's a single transgene with three viruses. We're continuing to screen these adeno-associated virus tools at the Allen. And what we would like to provide the community is accessibility to any molecularly defined cell class or type, starting with the cortex and then expanding to the whole brain. And here I'm summarizing our current state um, of uh, tools. Uh, we have a number of tools that have been validated by MFISH and single cell RNA-seq and mostly target subclasses or classes, but we also have some that target very fine uh, types. We will continue, uh, especially with the support from NIH to screen and again, um, provide these tools to the community. So the future, um, I would really be excited to see um, our single cell transcriptomics atlas of cell types across the adult mouse brain. Um, Hong Kui Zhang has received uh, funding from the NIH to do this and uh, has assembled a large team. And we are, in fact, um, ahead of schedule to complete this uh, single cell transcriptomics atlas. That means throughout the mouse brain, we will have individual cells profiled, clustered, um, cell types defined, data publicly available, and then taxonomies provided to the community in a versioned manner. We would also like to define cell type cards, a cell type uh, based on the region that it comes from, the gene expression signatures, and potentially correlation with other modalities such as morphology um, or electrophysiology. And then what I find uh, to be an extremely interesting future development is, and as Mike has alluded to, um, we would like users to be able to interact with our taxonomies. Uh, perform here what I just preliminarily call cell type blast. External user brings their data to our website, for example, single cell transcriptomics data. It's able, uh, the user is able to um, use these um, 
individually generated um, single cell data, for example, transcriptomics data to blast our taxonomies. And then uh, the user can um, retrieve assigned cell types for their data based on Allen taxonomies. Beyond um, the data and interactions with the data, um, what I'm particularly interested in is the next steps. How can we enable um, um, neuroscience community not only to, uh, uh, to characterize their cell types and represent them in, their, in for example, Allen Institute taxonomies, but to build and characterize transgenic and adeno-associated virus tools where they can further um, examine these types. So what we are pursuing together with a large um, group of investigators that are part of the Brain Initiative Cell Census Networks, it was, is we are integrating these, their external data sets with our data sets to define cell class of type specific regulatory elements. So what I've shown you for, um, for cortex, we would like to do throughout the mouse brain. And then we would like to characterize most promising tools in multiple platforms and species for now, probably focused on mice and uh, uh, select primates and humans. Ultimately, we would like to provide to the community publicly available data sets and taxonomies, uh, publicly available reagents, and recipes for targeting cell classes, subclasses, and types in the mouse and primate brain. For example, take transgene X and virus Y uh, with a prescribed titer and delivery route, and that will enable you to access a cell type C. With this, I would like to finish and thank our founder, Paul Allen, for his vision, encouragement, and support, and for enabling um, a remarkable team of scientists to be assembled and to work together um, for the benefit of the neuroscience community. And with this, I will take questions. Thanks so much, Basilika. Um, uh, one first question is, what are what do you see as the main challenges currently with analyzing this gene expression data that you described, and what are the computational bot bottlenecks to make sense of uh, of the data? Yeah, we are really. I you know I wasn't aware when we were getting into this and where we are now that basically one of the key problems that we are encountering is uh, really the data matrix size, meaning now we have millions of cells and we have characterized these millions of cells for tens of thousands of properties. How do you now analyze these data? How do you even assemble it into a single, call it a data object, data matrix? So this is one you can call infrastructure challenge, but it actually has proven not to be trivial. So we really need to reach out to um, to various uh, collaborators um, and mostly sort of cloud providers um, to actually be able to analyze these data. So this is one major challenge. The second challenge is really how do we describe these taxonomies in a more principled way? We clustering sort of focuses on discreteness. It's okay, of course, we need to start somewhere, but what we see increasingly. Um, in basically every data set we've analyzed is that these cell type landscapes are a combination of discrete and continuous um, gene expression variation. And clustering is not well equipped to deal with continuous gene expression variation. So I'm really looking forward to, for example, Uyghur's team to develop a more principled way where we can describe these cell type landscapes um, and not emphasize just discreteness, but also include the continuity. Hmm. And of course, finally, multimodal data. Multimodal data are uh, extremely exciting, um, patch seek data, um, especially, trying to actually make sense potentially of other properties and how they relate to transcriptomic properties, and then close to my heart, genetic tools. And uh, thank you. And and on, on the on the topic of genetic tools, um, one one I think we have time for one other question. And 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 that is, um, have, have, what are your thoughts on using those genetic tools not just to you know, describe the the, the, the different uh, the taxonomies and cell types, but also to quantify how many of each cell type there is, how many of these kind of basic components of the circuit are, are there. 
Yeah, I think uh, um, I want to be always cautious with our single cell transcriptomics because uh, as we have noticed uh, repeatedly, some cells tend to die more than others when they're isolated. So I would really caution anybody using our single cell transcriptomics data not to assume that the proportions of cells in the data set accurately represent the proportions in the tissue. But not everything is lost. First, there is single nucleus profiling, which more accurately represents proportion. And then the new, um, the new frontier is really in C2 transcriptomics profiling, mostly with multiplex uh, single molecule fish. You cannot profile all the genes, but you can smartly select genes so that you can actually um, do, uh, let's say 250 genes and do it really in situ. Then you bypass these issues with isolation of cells, differential survival, and you should be ab able to get really an accurate census and count of all the cells and types in the mouse brain. Okay. Thanks so much, Thanks for Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so next, uh, next is our first uh, invited speaker of user uh, user of the um, at the Allen Institute data, and that's uh, and that is Gabriella Michel. Um, Gabriella had her um, had a PhD at uh, Institute of Neuroinformatics in Zurich, uh, working on modeling and theory of uh, of um, of how the the cortex uh, developed. And um, and is now an associate in uh, in in Genilia in the in the group of uh, Nelson, uh, Nelson Spruston, um, and um, is going to talk to us about uh, molecular signatures of uh, CA1 projection classes. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah. Nuno, for the introduction. And before I start, I would like to thank uh, Nuno, Saskia, and Anton for inviting me to present my work today. So as Nuno was mentioning, um, I'm going to present about a project that I'm currently working on, which is about identifying the molecular signatures of CA1 projection classes. So before I started uh, working with uh, CA1, um, I was always wondering about the question of how do neurons find their synaptic targets? And this question uh, makes myself wonder a lot because there are 86 billion neurons in the brain and nevertheless, you see that cells in the brain are able to find their targets so specifically. So to start studying that, I uh, started to focus on the cortex. And I particularly was interested in studying uh, brain development because it is during development, the time when connectivity starts. And during mouse development, um, precursor cells start to divide and give rise to different populations until at the end of mouse development, you have a mouse that has connect connectivity that it's just starting to develop, but also you have different layers. And in this schematic, you can see that there are different types that give rise to other cells in different colors. And what I'm going to show you now is one of these cortical simulations that I developed during my PhD. And this work was together with some other people in Zurich. So in this simulation, we used a software called uh, Cortex3D. So simulations are in 3D. These uh, simulations are agent-based, meaning that there is not a global controller that controls the whole simulation. And this is also modular. With just very few functions, you are going to see the cortex emerge. And here in gray, you see the precursors of all the neurons. In yellow, you see the caudal and medial ganglionic eminences, which are going to give rise to the inhibitory population of cells. And in here in black, you will see the thalamic input that will project towards the cortex. So let me start the simulation. So at this point, the neural precursor cells start to divide. And then they will give rise to the different layers of the cortex. So where the colors represent the different layers. So here in yellow is the preplate, and then in lighter yellow is the subplate. And then at some point, the, the cortex starts to build itself in an inside out fashion. So here is the layer six in red. And then here you see the population of interneurons for layer six. Then in green, you see layer five cells that bypass layer six cells. And then the interneurons start to produce, uh, the interneuron compartment 
creates layer five neurons that will be integrated together with the excitatory population. And at this point, the, thalamic, uh, the thalamus starts to project towards the cortex um, while the cortex keeps developing. So here is layer four. And here is the, the interneuron populations destined to layer four. And finally, the last layer is our layers two and three, which are in lighter blue. And here at this point, the thalamus starts to project towards layer four. And then you can see these arborizations that are being formed. And this is just the, the finished simulation where we are just highlighting the arborizations. And so in, in addition, data from the cortex has shown that there are projection types that have distinct molecular signatures. So for example, uh, in the work from, from the Svoboda lab, Mike Economo published in 2019, that you can find uh, different types of um, pyramidal tract neurons for the layer, uh, layer five in motor, motor cortex. And these ones, the green ones, they project to the thalamus, and these ones in pink, they project to the medulla. And when they look at their transcriptomic profiling, they can see that indeed these two cells, although they are in the same layer, they have distinct molecular signatures. So now my idea when I moved on to the, to the postdoc was to actually do uh, not simulations, but start to work on in vivo data in order that I could expand uh, my, my models. So in, in the Spruston lab, what we are interested in is in studying CA1, and I'm interested in studying CA1 because it has been uh, involved in memory, learning, uh, spatial navigation, and it's also one of the main inputs of the hippocampal formation. So uh, the way in which we study CA1 is we combine electrophysiology, behavior, uh, imaging, modeling, RNA sequencing, and cell reconstructions. And the idea is actually to have all these modalities analyzed at the same time in order to have a more rich data set. And not only I, I can study this, but I can also profit from the free available data sets and open source from the Allen brain, such as the connectivity atlas, the cell types database, the in situ hybridization database, and the standard one, which is the reference atlas. So a uh, primary evidence, preliminary evidence, that there are different types of projecting classes in CA1 came from the Klausberger lab. So what they did there so, um, was to, to put a tetrode in ventral CA1 and then inject the CA1 also with channel rhodopsin and then also put optic fibers in regions where the CA1 is known to project to. So the medial prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens and the, um, the amygdala. So what they achieved with that was to see that when they were recording uh, ventral CA1 cells and when they were photostimulating these three different regions, what they could see is that actually CA1 cells do not project the same information to one of these regions. Basically, they send, these cells send different messages to one area or multiple areas of those. So that's why I'm interested in that. And I want to see if this, um, what are these, um, these transcriptional identities of these cells. What they also discovered was that when they put mice in to do different behaviors, different of these populations are activated. So for example, when the mice was here put in an elevator, in an elevated maze, um, in a task where, with, where they are tar uh, starting to see anxiety, the medial prefrontal cortex cells were the ones that were activated. And then the amygdala, well, the amygdala prefrontal cortex and nucleus accumbens were activated when there were sharp wave ripples. And so they, they, they concluded with this that although they tested three regions, the messages that CA1 
is sending are distinct. So now um, to my project. So what I would like to do is do a molecular profiling of these PA1 projection classes. And for doing that, first, I need to identify what are the target regions of CA1. So from that we can obtain from literature, from the Allen Brain uh, database, or we can also do injections, or we can also profit from the mouse light database, which I will show to you in a moment. And the idea is that we do these retrograde injections in these target regions of CA1. And of course, if this is not successful, we need to revise the injection coordinates because there are different people that have injected in these targets. And once this is successful, we can do sorting and then we can do bulk RNA sequencing. And this we can compare with the Allen Brain uh, data from single cell. And the idea is to do this comparison is because of the sequencing depth. So markers that might be important for one of these populations might be not uh, shown when we are doing single cell, and that's why we want to do both. And then eventually we would like to do in situ validation. So the first step is to look at what are common CA1 target regions, and we can make use of the Allen Connectivity Atlas. So in this um, atlas, what they've done is they injected um, some fluorophore in particular regions, and they can see where they are measuring this fluorophore in, in other areas. So here they have two experiments where they injected in, in wild type animals. They injected EGFT in CA1. So this is one experiment and this is the second. And then what they can measure is where they find this EGFP. So here we have an indication of where, where CA1 might be connecting to. So you have C1, C2, C3. So this is the hippocampal formation. We have the striatum, we have subiculum, prosubiculum. And this can give us, give us the first indication of where we can actually start to identify these projection classes. Another data set that we can use is the mouse light data set. So the mouse light data set is a, also a publicly available data set from Janilia. And they have thousand reconstructed neurons. And uh, where in this case, I'm only showing you 14 of those, which me and others have reconstructed. So these are CA1 cells um, where each color is one cell. And this here highlighted in green is the, is the CA1 field. And what I wanted to see is what, what do we see from these cells just by an initial analysis of those cells? So this is a coronal view. So here is a top view from these 14 cells as well. And then here you can start to appreciate that although we have like just a number of 14, we can see that there are different, they are projecting to different places. And here is again a sagittal view of the same neurons. So what we can do initially is start to see if neurons that project to the same places have similar morphologies. So let me show you some of these examples. So for example, cells that have the soma in CA1 and project to the striatum and lateral septum have these morphologies. And here is again a sagittal view and you can see that the morphologies look similar. Let me show you another example of the medial septum. So here again, the soma is located in CA1 and these are the morphologies of these cells. And let me show you another example, the retrosplenial area, these cells again have C1 and then project to re retrosplenial. And what, what we can do with that is, although again, these are 14 cells, we can see that um, cells have different, um, they, it seems that they might be different types. For example, striatum and lateral septum, you find these cells that behave in this way, mainly that they project to both these regions. You have um, these cells that project to the striatum, set, set, lateral septum, and medial septum. You have this pair here that projects to the brainstem, pre-subiculum, and post-subiculum, etc. And in this way, we can start to, again, use this data for seeing where we can do this in these retrograde injections, but also to appreciate that there might be potential uh, cell types for CA1 with respect to the place where they are projecting. So, but how, how can I um, continue with this? 
So basically, we know that there are TA1 projects to different regions. So now the idea is that we do injections in these target regions and we use retrograde labels. So for example, let's inject the lateral interrhinal cortex. We do a single injection. We let the virus express and then we collect CA1. We can do sorting of these cells and then we can do bulk RNA sequencing. And then in addition, we can, this, this is an example of one, of one injection, but we can also do two, for example, lateral interrhinal cortex and medial interrhinal cortex. We do double injection, each one with one color, and then the cells that we take from C1 might be yellow, um, and then we can do a manual sorting, and then again, do bulk RNA sequencing and compare it between each other and between also the single cell RNA sequencing data from the Allen. And this strategy allows us to use different combinations of these fluorophores in order to, to assess what are these molecular, molecular signatures of these CA1 projection classes? So one, one of the examples, I can show you here an example of uh, an injection that we did in medial septum. So we injected medial septum, we let the virus expressed for one month, and then we observed the, the ventral CA1, and we see here there is a labeling. This is the CA1, and then we can see that compared to the Allen brain atlas and this the next step would be to sequence this with bulk and then compare it with um with the data from the alien so and now what we can also do is uh, as i've been mentioning that we can use the uh, the single cell rna sequencing data from the allen and there was a recent published uh, publication as basilica was saying where they um they have hippocampal cells, and we can start to use these cells to compare it to also to our data set. And you can see this publication here, and in, here in this browser, you can analyze different populations of those. So what I'm working on right now is manipulating and identifying these different C1 projection types. And the idea, as I've been mentioning, is to compare the single cell RNA sequencing data with both. And, you know, genes are not um, static entities, but they are interacting in a network. So the idea is to identify these gene regulatory networks for CA1 projection classes. And now we can start to integrate it in, in modeling and in simulations. So right now the idea would be to collect data from RNA sequencing, mouse light data, Allen data, electrophysiology data, et cetera, and then improve our simulations. But not only that, but also to use modeling and simulations to actually uh, kind of direct where we would like to do the next experiments. And just to finish, I would like to um, acknowledge my postdoc advisor, Nelson, and the Spruston Lab, in particular, David Hunt, and the people from Mouselite, Daniel Amatiago, and the people from the Vivarium, Sarah Kendra and Salvador. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks so much, uh, Gabriela. Um, uh, while we wait for some questions to appear, I have a, I have a, um, I have a, I have a couple. Mm -hmm. One of them is related to something that you just said at the end, that um, genes don't, uh, they are not individual entities, they kind of, uh, they, they, are, they can be in a way a network. And, and I was wondering if you, you have this, you have the, the, the gene expression of these different neurons that have different targets in the brain. Mm -hmm. Is there any relationship between, between the genes that the neuron expresses and the genes that are expressed in their target region? Well, um, that's something that, that, that's why I'm doing kind of this project, because if I'm interested in connectivity, maybe there is a signature that the a neuron of source and the target region have in common, or maybe not, but just the, that's, why, that's the idea of checking both the source and the target to see if we can find some some sign that there might be something in common. Um, I have a, 
another question, uh, Gabriela. And mm -hmm. that is, do you expect each transcriptomically defined C1 cell type to have unique projection patterns? Um, is there any evidence of such specificity or against it? Well, I mean, if you would look at any two cells, you would see that they are um, individual and that probably they project to same locations. I mean, we have seen that there are cells that project to same locations. Um, and we expect that these transcriptional types would also have the same gene expression. And then, I mean, we have seen data from the cortex where this, this is the case, that cells that project to a, a particular region have a different, uh, a same transcriptional type. So we are expecting that this would also be the case for CA1. But of course, it depends on where you look at. When you look at, at the neuron's DNA, you will see that two neurons are very different in, you know, they are mutations. But then if you look further, there are be, I mean, we have clearly inhibitory cells and pyramidal cells, and those are classifications that we can start doing. So we are doing basically here a classification based on similarity of projections. And uh, maybe one other question, uh, Gabriela, is there, do you see any relationship between the local morphology of the, the neuron and its, and its um, pattern of, uh, of targets of projections? Or locally they look, they look basically all the same and the, the diversity is really, as far as you, you can see, is expressed in their different uh, pattern of connectivity. So we, we see, I mean, when we look at it closely, they see all, they seem, I mean, we only see that they are from the same location based on their soma. But we, um, if we took, if we take two neurons, I've been reconstructing two neurons that are neighbors and they look morphologically very, very different. But then when we analyze the projection, the places where they are projecting, they seem to be projecting to the same locations. Mm. So I guess it's a combination of, of many things. So sometimes the morphology seems similar, but the projection is different. And then and the other way around, sometimes the projection seems to be the same, but, the, but not the morphology of the cells. Mm. All right. Thanks so much, Gabriela. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, now we're going for a, a little, little break. We're we are we're going to be back at uh, 9:45 and and we're going to be back uh, again with the uh, Allen Institute speaker which is which is Lydia who's going to talk about the um, our common coordinate framework of the um, of the of the um, of, of the mouse brain that allows us to integrate all of these data sets in a, in a, in, a, in a single framework um so hope to see you all in about um, 25 minutes Thank you, and thank you so much for the speakers, um, uh, Mike, uh, Batilica, and uh, and Gabriela. Lydia and Eva, if you want to practice uh, or test your screen share during this break time, please just drop a note in the chat. Lydia, I saw your email. I'll bring you up in a moment. Hello. Good morning. I can see and hear you. So we're off to a great start. Am I am I clear? I have people saying sometimes I'm not clear on my mic. You're a little quiet, but I can okay. understand you. All right. I will try to speak louder because I haven't worked out how to turn my mic up yet. <laughs> uh, well, let's test screen share. And then I do have a suggestion of how you might be able to turn up your mic. Okay. All right. So, oh, look at that. Share screen, pick this one. Uh, 
Am I doing it? Who am I doing? You it? sure are. I can see your whole desktop. Oh, okay. Uh, so how do I, okay. Close it. Share screen again. Oh, application window. This one. Looks great. All right. I did the thing in which you make PowerPoint in the window. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then I can I can still go forward. Awesome. All right. Stop sharing. Okay. Suggestion about the mic. Yeah. So if you go into the settings, um, there should be like a sound settings. And one settings. of the options. Settings hmm? of what? Oh, the computer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like control panel or whatever it's called. There are so many settings. Okay. Microphone setup. Voices, choose your voice. So you've got the sound panel? Oh, wait a second. Uh, choose your output device. Oh, no. My input device. Okay. There should be something in sound that's input device, recording, microphone, something along those lines. Yes. And then if you select your microphone, you should be able to turn up the gain. Device properties. Hello. Um, in addition to device properties. Oh, here we go. Levels. Everything is a hundred. Continue on the world. Hello. That sounds about the same to me. I bet this. Hello. Oh. That sounds a little better. All right. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes, you definitely sound louder now. All right. Oh, I know what it's trying to do. Hello. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Let's 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 stick to that and let's not touch that. I don't know what I did, but I'm not going to touch it anymore. Yes. I think I'm good. All right. All right. Well, I will turn your uh, camera microphone off, um, but you're the next speaker, so I can just leave you on screen. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back. Yes, Thank you. we'll see you in a few minutes.
We're going to start back up in about five minutes.
All right, we're at the time to get started again. All right, um, and 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 our next speaker is uh, Lydia Nang, which um, which uh, she has originally a PhD in electronics from I don't know if I can say this name Macquarie University in in Australia, and and she she joined the institute I think in two thousand and four, where and she's currently the senior director um, the senior director for. Um, uh, architecture. Um, Lydia, Lydia, I guess is known to all of us, and I guess to many of you are users of our data as as the person that led a, a lot, if not most, of the infrastructure that is used to share all of our uh, data sets. Um, she has also been highly involved in standardize and integrate neuroscience uh, data, and uh, today she's uh, going to talk to us about the. Um, the common coordinate framework for our mouse atlas. Uh, please take it, Lydia. Thank you for for participating. Thank you. Let me let me share my window. I practiced this. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Nunu and Saskia and Anton for organizing this workshop and asking me to participate. Um, as Nunu said, I'm part of the uh, what is now known as a data and technology team. And what we do is collaborate with our scientists internally and externally to, you know, make the data sort of uh, more useful, process it, visualize it. Um, and then because I work with a team of engineers, they typically start with what problem are we trying to solve? And I'm so grateful coming after Gabriella. We want to help Gabriella as um, you know, there's no one sort of data set that's going to answer all the question. And the answer will lie into integrating multiple data sets together, just like how Gabriella has shown for CA1. And then so what kind of, you know, we can't say we're integrating more data. So specifically, uh, the Allen Institute for its first 10 years have produced sort of many reference uh, gene expression maps. So this is one thing that people are still using and we want to continue to make that available for people. Um, in the in the sort of second 10 years, the Allen Institute is more deeply into wanting to understand and characterize cell types, uh, as you heard from Basilica this morning. And here we're looking at single cells now, uh, looking at transcriptomic, electrophysiology, morphology, and also, you know, in terms of connectivity and its function. And, you know, in the last few years, uh, we are now part of this sort of uh, NIH uh, Brain Initiative Consortium. Uh, there are the little graph there with the blue box in the middle is our integration project as we are working with more than sort of 20 or so individual labs who are uh, also doing uh, cell types sort of characterization over different uh, species, mouse, human, uh, the marmoset, using different technologies and whatnot. Um, uh, science is a changing field, but the only thing yeah. is that there will be more data because we need to know more information that needs to be integrated. Integrated. So part of the charter of our group is to think about integration. Um, so to me, integration, there's two components. One of it is uh, what I call semantic in which we're trying to uh, model the data. And when I say model, I don't mean the fun stuff like modeling cells and, and, and activity that you'll hear in this workshop. I'm talking about more of the mundane stuff of who, what, where, why, who, who did the experiment, what was it about, uh, where did they keep the files, how big are files, what type of, what is the type of the file. And all in, uh, and we're doing that such that people can um, ease, more easily access that data. And important things to consider there is when you're doing data modeling is to group things that are similar together, uh, group things that are actually the same thing to mean the same thing. And more importantly, when, when the things are different and ability to tell them apart, such that as a user of their data, uh, they can they can see and, um, um, and know the difference as they're using the data. Uh, an even better way than just semantic is actually to use coordinates. Uh, for in the brain, I think you you know and and heard uh, through many sessions that uh, the location of uh, of a brain structure and cell type 
uh, you know a lot about it once you know its location. So one other framework for integration that's really important is a spatial framework. And hence it's the, 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 uh, the, the impetus of doing a, a common coordinate framework for the mouse brain. Um, we have, uh, this has been recently published in Cell. Uh, so here I'm just showing you the highlights here. So what is the uh, common coordinate framework? So it is a 3D uh, average template or reference space. Uh, it is made, uh, constructed from um, 1,675 mites. Uh, and the and the average of uh, and the resolution that we can get out of this average is about 10, 10 microns uh, voxel resolution. Uh, once we got this average space, uh, there was a multi-year effort to annotate it. And in annotation, what you're doing there is bringing current knowledge about what's happening in the brain into this framework. So to me, that's a, a layer of knowledge integration. Uh, we uh, were able to delineate 43 isocortical structures and then like 329 subcortical structures, there's ventricular structures, and there was a great effort into uh, identifying the, all the different fiber tracks uh, because it is sort of the communication gateway between these two of these structures. Uh, like everything else we do, the Allen CCF is open access and is available through uh, atlas.bring-map.org. Um, here uh, is uh, basically our authors list because it does take a village to build this thing and it did take many years. So we started this process in um, 2013. Uh, we, at that point, we had a, uh, the first prototype of what an average template would look like. Uh, we, uh, we, that, we did that process over a year and then spend the next remaining three years on this annotation. And this is what I will be presenting today. So let's start with, well, where did the 1,675 brains come from? Because that's a lot of specimen and that is part of the, the beauty of this source because we were able to get uh, this large set of data. And it all comes, the data, uh, it originates from our Allen um, Mouse Connectability Atlas. Um, for this atlas, we use a serial true photon tomography system. Um, and what that is, is that uh, instead of doing the slices and then you put it on a, on a slide to, to image, we're imaging the block face of the brain, cut it and then imaging it again. And what this is, what this gives us is keeping the data in a very high uh, high fidelity for its 3D shape because we're imaging it before you cut it, so there's much less distortion. And because we had access to this data set, we were able to basically leverage a large number of highly impact 3D data in order to build an average template. Uh, the, the, however, this data is still very uh, anisotropic in, in which we image it in plane at about uh, 0.3 microns, but then we take a 100 micron gap uh, before we get the next section. So while we have a lot of data, you can, you can still uh, view it as also uh, sparsely sample data. So what do we do with this data? Uh, so first thing is then we do this averaging. Um, and this averaging, uh, it, it's, it's done in iterations. So what we do with a reference, um, in this case, uh, we started actually with the original initial for the Allen Reference Atlas because we wanted to uh, keep the same pose as our original atlas because we see this as the next generation of it. And so we want to make sure that we get that link. Uh, you first you simply register all the data to that reference and then you average it. It becomes the new template. You register everything again uh, and you average it. This process that you find that as you iterate through this process, your average becomes clearer and clearer. Uh, we started with just using uh, uh, just a rigid transform. And once we reach a certain convergence, we then uh, allow some uh, Asline transform, once that reached conversion, we then uh, allow deformable transform into this process until we get to uh, a very end here, which is H, uh, in which um, you see that the, this average 
actually comes up well with the average of low animals, it actually has high anatomical details where, uh, and it typically it will show up where there is a consistent detail over all the specimens. So the top level, top here, um, I guess it depends on how big your monitors are as to what details you can see. So the top row here is basically show uh, the different iterations. So this is the first one, this is the first, and the second one is the third, and the fifth, and the seventh uh, iteration mm -hmm. of the average itself. So within each average, we, we also have that convergence of each average. The middle row there show mm -hmm. a uh, maximum intensity projection. Um, as you can see, that in the, the richness in which you can see all the barrels, you can see the reconstruction uh, of the hippocampus, and then uh, I will move to the next frame so that we can get more detail. Um, one thing that we observed that we were able to capture uh, what, what we call in quotes this super resolution effect. So on the top row here is basically a single brain um, that one of one of the thousand or so brains that we have, and then we compare it to the same region to the average template. So in this barrel area, in a single brain, it really, it's kind of difficult to make out the barrel, but you can see it. So there's a consistency of patterning there. Um, but then in average, that becomes uh, more uh, distinct is because that pattern exists over all the specimens. And each time we have uh, one of these, uh, each time it has more information, it, it makes it that data even more higher. There are other details in the single brain that don't show up. For example, uh, the, the black lines in the cortex that represent the blood vessel. Uh, that patterning is a really distinct per specimen. So in the average template, you don't see that, uh, that patterning. So things that are consistent gets more highlighted and sharp and things that are inconsistent get blurred out. Uh, so as a team, we were very excited when we saw the barrel. Uh, we were even more excited when we looked at the back of the brain and saw this sort of, uh, it, we're now looking at uh, eye, uh, saw this beautiful patterning at the back. And we, and sorry, uh, and then we were uh, looking in literature, we figured out that there were the barrel X, which are related to barrel. Again, it's very hard to see that in a single, single frame. Uh, but through the averaging, um, this sort of signature pops out more. Um, and remember, and then looking at J, then now we're looking at a sagittal view. Uh, remember I said that the data was actually uh, 100 microns uh, apart. Uh, you can see that in 100 microns, you still get very good sort of anatomical uh, view, but signatures uh, are really washed out. But because we have so many data sets uh, that and we rely on the fact that each frame was cut in a slightly different start and end in a slightly different position, we were able to sort of reconstruct uh, uh, details, uh, even if we have 100 micron sectioning, because we had so many brains there and we used an average, we were able to capture uh, out of plane details such as the barrel words in the BPM. Um, and then there's, and, and, and this is seen uh, all over the brains and also in a subcortical area. Okay, now once we have the template, uh, the, the next part is to do annotation. Um, so the annotation is done, uh, uh, originally we've had two sort of senior neuroanatomists, uh, Guan Chen Wang and Song Lin Dong. Uh, what they do is they start from literature. Uh, what does all the other atlas say about the structure today? Uh, what is what is current in the literature known about this structure? They look into the template. They look at our transect line. They look at connectivity atlas our historic, uh, and various histology data. And once they are sort of uh, confident in what they're seeing, then they will sort of lay out uh, structures uh, in a sort of in a sampled way. And then we have uh, 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 multiple people who are uh, reconstruction team then try to build out 3D structures from this. Uh, they first start by um, um, annotating it at samples. So they, they almost get this weave effect 
And as they sort of clean up and hone on it, they start to fill in that weave. And the final step is that the structure don't sit in isolation. So we need to make sure that it fits with its surrounding structure as well. All right, here's an example, uh, a deep example of the interpenuncular nucleus. Uh, this is just to show you the variety of data that our, our anatomists use to uh, determine, you know, very small partition. And one of the things that uh, that we're most proud of on this paper is that there is a giant Excel spreadsheet that talks about each of these structures in which we can back reference some a lot of the data set is available also through the Allen brain map as well. Uh, so that not only do you get the structures, you will get uh, to know you you will get reference to the data sets that were we'll used. So here we have used uh, uh, both uh, crinoline expression and also connectivity data in order to draw the subpartition. Um, again, I, I think at the beginning I'm introduced as an engineer, so I'm not 100% sure what these regions do. I just know the process of, of how we went about annotating it. Okay, so because we have this 3D framework, uh, we had an opportunity to, okay, it's in 3D and we know that the brain isn't, everything we want to see and know about the brain doesn't always lie in a coronal, sagittal or horizontal plane. Um, the cortex is, a, is one of the uh, area of focus for us. So was there an opportunity here to do a coordinate system that made sense for the cortex? So mouse cortex, even though that it's sort of smooth, it is still uh, varying in thickness and is bent in both ends. So here, what we did was uh, develop a curved coordinate system. Uh, we first uh, made sure we outlined where the isocortex was. Um, our annotation team did that using uh, certain free lines. And then we used the geometry of the, of the outer and the inner uh, components of isocortex. Uh, we, we, we then solve a Laplace for that to, to basically try to find sort of a, uh, um, equidistant uh, uh, position along the two, two surfaces, uh, uh, allowing for different thicknesses. And then once we sort of have these sort of equidistant sort of potential lines, we then took every point from the surface and then we did a stiffened descent to get a uh, what we call a streamline. Um, here, uh, the little dots uh, is one streamline. It's only a dot because a streamline isn't uh, completely visible in one coronal plane because it's actually following the curvature. And in an F here, you can see that these streamlines are basically bending with the with the curvature of the brain. So right now we're saying, well, by the shape of the cortex, this is roughly where we predict if you have any sort of element that goes uh, uh, perpendicular to the, to the cortex, it, by, by its geometry, it should roughly lie along that there. So once we've done that, uh, we can actually have additional tools to help our anatomist to uh, annotate the cortex. So instead of always having to view data in the coronal plane or sagittal plane, we were able to project information always to the surface of the cortex uh, for integration. And, and also this sort of surface view uh, ties into a lot of uh, uh, physiology data that people are using to, 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 to sort of capture and pinpoint where functional regions. Yeah. So we are using that, uh, the top row here is simply us projecting data from a top view uh, of the brain. Uh, so that was the template. You can see you can, uh, see the visual areas, you can see uh, the barrels and other sort of somatic, uh, uh, somatosensory regions and also the uh, primary auditory region. Uh, here we have projected uh, free line expression, we have uh, taken several injections from in the visual areas and color coded them. So we did a, like a pseudo uh, a, a visual topic map here. At the back here, the green stuff is if we take all data that was injected on the other side of brain, see its projection path on the other side uh, to do a sort of virtual 
a virtual sort of uh, just to see what re what areas are projected because it sort of misses the sort of primary area. So that's another uh, piece of data we can provide for an anatomist, also projection data. And this was the what was uh, used to come up with the 43 regions of the cortex. But this is one of the several views we presented to the uh, to our anatomist. Uh, and more recently, well, we said, well, what happens if we flatten the whole thing out? You know, what what can we see? So down the bottom row here is us simply flattening out the whole brain uh, by virtue of picking like two points uh, to act as the horizontal axis, another two point to act as a vertical axis. And we just computed the geodesic uh, coordinate uh, distance from those points and then plotted the whole space in 2D just based on that. So what you see in A is that, okay, our, all our streamlines, uh, which direction are they facing? Are they facing the front? Are they facing the, the back, the, uh, the lateral and medial? Uh, the middle part is showing the different thickness of the cortex as you as you measure it through the, uh, the streamline. Uh, is it facing up or if it's facing down? And we were able to uh, project all the lines that our anatomist found it into this flat map as well. I'm doing one time. So uh, one of the things now- You've now got just about 10 minutes. Uh, we wanted to say, well, how does it compare to actual data? Uh, so one of the uh, uh, analysis we did, well, let's try to compare the streamline with some thick tufted uh, layer five neurons. So we use this SIM1 pre AJ18 free line, uh, it just happens to be very sparse so that we can actually see the dendrite. So we were lucky this was a very sparse free line. Um, here, E, F, and G, it was a injection in this sort of somatosensory area. Uh, you can see that uh, you can see the dendrites going out there. Uh, the top part is the actual data. Uh, the middle part shows uh, the data after segmentation and registration to the CCF. And then so this is this sort of highlights the signal a little more. And because everything in the CCF, we are able to give you a sagittal view of the data. And in the sagittal view, you can see that the dendrites are leaning a little bit. Uh, in the last column here, we're simply showing you how the uh, streamlines are actually not completely vertical. Uh, in this view. So all the dots on the top here represent a set of streamlines. Uh, as you go back towards the brain, uh, the streamline is sort of curved and you get a little bit of it each time you move uh, in the corona, corona um, direction. So one of the tricks that you can do, okay, we have streamlines, we just flatten the whole cortex. So the top uh, OMP just uh, uh, is a visualization of the cortex flatten uh, according to uh, the streamlines. Um, and then uh, the, the, the left panel shows uh, a sort of uh, a MIP as you go uh, medial lateral. And then P uh, and its subsequent is a MIP as you go anterior posterior. So with SSP, we said that it was curved. We can, we can after uh, all our norm, uh, spatial normalization, our dendrites are facing up, both in our pseudo, pseudo coronal and our pseudo sagittal. Uh, we picked another data set, which was in the visual area. Uh, this one in the visual area, it happens that the dendrites are pointing up. So you have these sort of nice, sort of nice looking lines here. And then we picked uh, 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 a, to look at a secondary motor area. Here, the data is actually practically horizontal. So uh, you can see, still see that the dendrites are going up. It's hard to see that in the real data, but once you sort of um, normalize it, it's, you could still retain uh, some of its sort of uh, dendrite sort of uh, signature. All right. Okay. So uh, that was a whirlwind tour. Uh, we have uh, multiple CCF viewing tools uh, in Allen Brain Map. If you start from uh, Allen uh, atlas.brainmap.org, uh, go to this area here. You can access a 3D viewer. 
a 2D sort of traditional Atlas viewer and their links to documentations and white papers and how to access a lot of the data that was used in the uh, annotation of the CTF. Uh, so, uh, so that we, I talked a lot about connectivity data and whole brain data. Uh, this is just to say we're on our way of using the CCF to map cell types data as part of this consortium. Uh, here we are going to uh, attempt to integrate one experiment in which they cut out bulk, uh, bulk tissue for molecular cell experiments. This is versus the Allen Institute, which tend to cut out small di dissections. So we have an ability, once everything is mapped to CCF, in order to compare not just its molecular signature, like the has, uh, has has presented, but uh, we have to now have the ability to also look at its sort of spatial signature and compare. Uh, here we have uh, an example of multimodal data. This is our patch seek data uh, from Nathan Gallons, and every single one of those cells are also mapped to the CCF. Uh, I want to make up time, but the I think the thing that gives me most joy is to watch the CCF being used in the community. All of these are, are, are tweets. I, I love science Twitter uh, of uh, different groups using uh, the CCF to look at uh, cort cortical uh, signal flow, um, and then using this uh, that top view of the CCF to visualize their data. Uh, this one down here is about decision making. Uh, this one is about ultrasound imaging. We have all these wonderful sort of graphics folks taking the CCF and making tools for other people. We have another group that's making uh, uh, cell detection and registration algorithms. And then other groups are basically looking at all our connectivity data and then uh, and then using that on the flat map to to view a uh, cortical to cortical. A, a cortical. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank Paul Allen, our founder, for his vision and encouragement and support. And then also thank the, all our scientists and everybody at the Allen Institute. Thanks so much, Lydia. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, we have a, a few a few questions. The the first one is, Lydia, could, could, could a user use the CCF version 3 to map the Allen reference atlas on a single microscopic coronal section? Ah, so so this is the in principle yes. Uh, we provided basically the atlas. Uh, then the trick is to find the, uh, the 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 algorithm that will allow you to do that. Uh, so while we don't have a tool that do that, um, multiple groups have been trying to solve that problem. Um, so so in principle yes, but you need the right methods for the mapping for the mapping. Uh, one of the things we try to do uh, on our community page was also uh, try to collect different groups during registration and then put pointers in there uh, for people to try out different. One one other question is, um, it, uh, how were the annotations at different resolutions obtained? Are they simple downscalings of the 10 microns version? Uh, yes. Right now, they we we I think if we're downsampling, we pick the, the the label of the centroid of the of the of the uh, voxel in the middle. And one other question is is about the curved uh, coordinate uh, framework. Is 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 it available? And and is it also going to be available for subcortical areas and the cerebellum? Uh, it is. So uh, those. The streamlines, uh, we we okay. The streamline for that top view is available uh, we, uh, uh, through one of our SDK libraries. Um, I need to publish all the streamlines so that people can make different views. Uh, and then, so the last bit is then: can, are we going to do it for different regions? I think that is like one of the projects that we have to schedule and prioritize. So currently, no. <laughs> Uh, but as we are we as we're able to collaborate and and sort of form projects uh, around that, well, there's every possibility to do so. But right now we don't have specific plans. I, I think there is a, a lot of interest in the hippocampus uh, based on uh, current uh, transcriptomic data. Uh, so that's a potential we are we are we are investigating. 
And and one last question, Lydia. Um, when you did this flatting, um, is is are there particular areas of the cortex that are more variable in terms of location across animals than others? And if yes, in a particular kind of uh, um, dim dimension or direction? Oh, so uh, there was one, uh, I uh, only had half an hour. There was one part of the paper that I didn't highlight is that uh, because we had uh, 2000 ish brains, uh, we actually did a variability study of um and so there in that paper and i believe that the the, the deformations are also available we produced this heat map of where things are most variable after so once we map it we all we will have the def deformation field so we actually quantify that variability as well so, so typically is the part of the brain that is bendy when you take it out of the brain Right, so between the cortex and the midbrain, where it's bendy, and between where the uh, olfactory bulb is, so typically those are the bendy parts, and then there are more subtle details uh, within a structure that is that has been quantified. Okay, well, again, thanks so much, Lydia, for participating. Thank you so much. And um, our um, next uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Jennifer Witzel, um, and 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 she's she's gonna she's gonna talk about uh, how inter aerial connectivity is is mapped to this to this uh, common common coordinate framework. Um, um, Jennifer. Um, as originally a, a PhD in uh, in neuroscience from uh, University of Colorado, and she at the Allen Institute, she's a she's a scientist, and she joined originally to 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 map um, um, intra aerial connectivity in disease models. But she has also been uh, highly involved on the on mapping the inter aerial connectivity in general, and and she's going to talk. She's going to talk and and give and give a, and and show us a practical guide to assessing and using this Allen Miles Brain Connectivity Atlas data. Um, thanks so much for Jennifer, and it's all yours. Great, thanks for the introduction, Nuno. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. All right. So yeah, as Nuno said, um, what I really focused on today was trying to give you some tips um, if you want to access and use this data. And I'm trying to think of the questions that I'm asked often. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a tour of, of you know, this data set and how it works. Um, so if anybody doesn't know at this point, um, the Allen Mouse Brain Connectivity Atlas, which you find at connectivity.brain-map.org, um, it's a high resolution map of axons in the mouse brain. And it was built on an array of transgenic mice that were genetically engineered to target specific cell types. So we have whole brain axonal projection data from viral tracing injections. Um, these were done in both wild type and transgenic mice. And online we have image data, quantification and visualization tools available. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do is talk through first our, just our experimental workflow and our informatics workflow so that you can understand the data better and how it's generated. And then I'm gonna give you some uh, specific applications and examples of accessing data through the website and accessing data through the API and through the SDK. And then I'm going to talk about how we go from individual experiments to looking at brain-wide connectivity mapping. All right, so I'll start with the experimental um, pipeline. So these experiments, of course, start with a stereotaxic viral tracer injection. Um, we use adeno-associated virus, AAV, and in general, um, the we use this synapsin promoter to drive uh, cytosolic EGFP expression. So the EGFP is gonna fill the whole entire cell, including the axon. So you can see all these projections. In the case of the Cree dependent tracers, uh, the Cree mice uh, have this Cree protein driven by a cell type specific promoter. And so in those animals, we use a Cree dependent AAV viral tracer so that in the presence of Cree, the cytosolic EGFP is flipped around and its expression is driven by the CAG promoter. Uh, and then again, we have cytosolic uh, EGFP expression filling the neurons. Um, so after injecting the viral tracer, we wait 21 days and then the brains are removed from the animals after the animals are sacrificed, embedded in these blocks of auger. 
and then we image them using serial two photon microscopy. And so the way this works is that our little serial two photon tissue site microscope scans one section of the image, and then there's an embedded microtome, I'm sorry, vibratome, that cuts a 100 micron section off the top, and then we scan the next section and the next and the next. Uh, and so the images are acquired on the block, on the face of the brain, the block face imaging, and so they're gonna come off the microscope intrinsically registered. Um, so then following imaging, uh, we generate 140 injection, or I'm sorry, 140 sections per brain. And then there is a quality control and annotation step. Um, so this is just showing you one section through the approximate center of an injection site. And if we zoom in on where the viral injection was and turn off the, the channels that don't have the information, um, hopefully you can see that there are some cell bodies uh, labeled in there. And um, we do often saturate this injection site so that we can resolve the individual axons. Um, but then we go in and we manually just draw a polygon around the cell bodies. And so that's what this looks like here on the right, in this red uh, circle. And that's how we differentiate the injection from the projections. So here's just um, some thumbnails to show you what a single experiment looks like. 140 sections from olfactory bulb through cerebellum. Um, but I do want to point out that these are all high resolution images. And so they were acquired at 0.35 by 0.35 microns, as I think Lydia mentioned. Um, so they're really high resolution individually. Okay, so then each of these sections goes through an automated detection process, uh, which we call segmentation. And so I'm showing just on the left, again, the same image and on the right, the segmentation mask. And then I've just enlarged it a little bit to show you the individual um, axons here. And this is all available online if you wanna check how this works. But basically it's, it's automated detection of the presence of GFP signal, not the brightness of the GFP signal. And so every pixel is just assigned a one or a zero uh, according to whether or not it contains GFP. All right, so once we get through this QC and annotation step, um, then of course, as Lydia just talked about, we acquire the um, the background fluorescence in the red channel, and that is used to align each individual brain to the CCF, the 3D reference space. Um, and then we use that same transform, the, the transform values from that deformable alignment to also align our segmentation mask to the CCF projection, or I'm sorry, to the um, reference, the reference space, the 3D reference space. So now we're going from pixels that are have the presence or absence of signal to voxels. And then each voxel will have a value indicating the number of GFP positive pixels that were transformed into that voxel. Um, so of course you just heard a, a lot of information about the CCF and the reference space. So I'm not gonna talk about it anymore there other than to point you to this recently published paper in Cell, um, which is a great resource if you wanna understand the CCF better. Uh, so then, of course, finally, uh, this data is quantified and presented on the website, uh, and I'm going to go through that in a lot more detail. So there's four different types of data output that, oh, excuse me, um, that we get from these experiments. Uh, the first is the raw images, which I've already shown you. Um, and as I mentioned, that's 140 sections per brain at 0.35 by 0.35 micron resolution. And then, of course, the, the corresponding segmentation masks. Uh, which are also available. And then um, we have what we call gridded projection data. So this is the segmented pixel registered to the CCF at 10, 25, 50, and 100 micron voxel resolution. And then finally, we have what we call structure unionizers. So then once each individual experiment is registered to the CCF, we can just overlay um, all of our annotated region boundaries and then quantify the number, the basically the number of pixels, but the, you know, the value of the voxels inside that structure, uh, we can just sum it up over a structure. So this is what we call a unionize, and it's the quantified projection density or projection volume per structure. Um, so this whole uh, connectivity atlas was generated in three different phases. Um, the first phase was to map axonal projections from uh, P56 male, C57 black, six mice. And so there were approximately 500 experiments there. And these, uh, this first set of experiments was published in Nature in 2014 in this O et al paper that many people are probably familiar with. Um, the second phase was then to map axonal projections from genetically defined cell types 
in and map their laminar specific projections using Cree driver mice. And so we have about 2,300 of these experiments in 119 cell lines. And um, this recent Harris et al. paper that came out just last year in Nature talks about the cortical and thalamic projections from phase two, but there are also additional subcortical injections that haven't been published yet. And then finally, we did some additional experiments. Um, the one that I just want to mention is that we mapped axonal projections from target-defined cell types. So, um, and these were in the isocortex, hippocampus, and thalamus. So these experiments involved paired anterograde and retrograde viral tracers with a retrograde Cree virus paired with an anterograde Cree dependent virus so that we could map cell, what we call projection defined cell types or uh, cell types that are defined by their projection targets. And so um, a lot of this data was included in this paper, um, which is in review at Neuron right now and is also available on BioArchive if you're interested in finding out more. So right now, if you go to um, connectivity.brain-map.org, what you'll see is that we have just under 3,000 experiments, and they're all mixed together here. So you need to use these tools, basically, to separate different mouse lines and tracer types. And I'm going to go through how to do that. Uh, so I want to go through um, some specific applications as we talk about how to access the data so that you can think about you know, what you might be interested in and, and what would be the most appropriate way to access the data for you. Uh, so the first application that I want to talk about is to is when you have a single region of interest or a single experiment of interest. And this is a pretty common use case that we talk about a lot. Um, and as an example, I just want to talk about this paper um, from Gordon Shepard's lab in 2016, where they really extensively mapped the connectivity between retrosplenial cortex and secondary motor cortex in the mouse. And so we're looking at figure one from that paper right here. And um, we see that there are retrosplenial cortex projections and secondary motor cortex projections. And so if we want to see where this data came from, we can go to connectivity.brainmap.org. And, um, and uh, the, this display here defaults to sagittal, uh, but I prefer looking at a top-down view. So I just want to point out there's sliders here, and you can rotate the brain however you want. I always just rotate it immediately, so I'm looking top down at the cortex because I work on a lot of cortical experiments. Uh, and then, um, so what I've done here is to search for retrosplenial cortex, which the abbreviation is RSP. Um, use the atlas to find the right abbreviation if you need to. Um, but also there's a drop down here that will let you choose. And then I've filtered for wild type mice. And you see I get a list of six experiments. And then we say, well, okay, how do we know you know which one this is. This looks like the right experiment, um, but fortunately, they uh, the authors here included the experiment ID in the figure legend, and so we can immediately verify that this is the correct experiment. And of course, this image uh, is this image right here. And we love it when people do this. We really encourage you to use our data visualization tools and to publish with them. Um, the our citation policy is in this little yellow button at the bottom of the page and you can just click on it and it'll tell you what to do and we love to share i mean we generate these for people to use so please please feel free to use any of the images that you find on our website um, and follow our citation policy here and if you have questions you can send us a message i'm also going to point you later to our um, community forum which is another place where you can get help but also feel free to click on this send us a message button this is going to route through the communications department and then it's going to come straight to scientists. So I answer these questions, other scientists answer these questions directly. Um, and we'll try to help you the best we can. Okay, so while we're looking at these data visualization tools, I want to just point out um, a couple other useful things. So again, this is the same view that I showed you on the previous page where we've searched for retrosplenial cortex injections in wild type mice. Uh, and I want to start with this little button up here on the top right, which is like a little eye, it's information. This is the most important uh, button, in my opinion, this has the most information. So if you click this, it's gonna launch a new window, uh, which has a really useful URL that contains the experiment ID. So of course, if you know your experiment ID, you can just go straight to this URL and plug it in. And it's going to give you um, some of the metadata for the experiment, the quantified injection site, also the stereotactic coordinates that were used to target this injection. Um, and then of course there's uh, image views here, which can be launched into a new window. 
and then a summary of our unionized data uh, for this experiment right here. Uh, there's a slider so you can change the threshold. Um, so you can just kind of visualize this online. I want to point out that these two buttons here are the same. So you can launch either from the connectivity.brainmap.org landing page or from the individual experiment page. Also, these two buttons are the same. Um, so, uh, so there's multiple ways to get to the tools that you want. Uh, the second button here is uh, it's going to launch the high resolution image viewer. And again, it's going to launch in a new window. And I put this URL here um, to demonstrate this is, a, this is a less useful URL. It's not going to have the experiment ID in it. But what this is really useful for is if you're building RMA queries to access the data through, um, through our API, you'll find a lot of the information you need in this URL. So I just want to point that out. Um, so now we're looking at a full screen view, of, or we would be, of this experiment, the same one I just showed you. And you can use these little tools to navigate. Um, right now it says uh, serial to photon tomography here. We can use this drop down and switch to projection segmentation. So if you want to check the segmentation mask for an experiment, that's how you do it. Uh, and then there's, whoops, there's also these two buttons up here that will let you um, bring up the atlas to see where you are in the brain and also change the contrast, which you're going to want to do um, probably to turn down the contrast because it's going to default to a pretty bright setting. Oh, also you can turn off individual channels here. For instance, if you don't want to see the red channel, you can just turn it off and only look at the green. Okay, uh, this, now I'm going to jump all the way over to the left and look at this cortical projection viewer button. So this is going to launch, again, another window and, again, a useful URL that has the experiment ID. Um, so you can look at these cortical maps for any experiment. Um, of course, if it's a subcortical experiment with subcortical projections, it will be less useful. But this is, rather than a maximal intensity projection like you see um, on the landing page, this is the projection of the signal along the streamlines that you just heard a lot about from Lydia. So now you're just looking at cortical um, pixels that were detected in the cortical area projected along the streamlines up to the surface. And you can add and remove the, the region boundaries here. And also for experiments that were targeted by intrinsic signal imaging, um, uh, which are generally visual cortex experiments, this is where you're going to find the ISI map that was used for the targeting. Okay, uh, finally, one more button I want to highlight is this 3D button. That's going to give you a pop-up that says, how do you want to visualize this data? Um, Brain Explorer 2, which is a desktop app that has been deprecated. So if you haven't used it before, I don't recommend using that. Um, rather, I would recommend launching this Brain Explorer web version, which is in beta. Um, but it's, again, going to launch a new window. And it will show you uh, the experiment um, using a fast marching algorithm to connect across the sections to sort of make these uh, pretty whole brain maps of the, where the projections are. But also this is a great way to explore the atlas, um, look at the CCF structures, all those sorts of things, and a good way to generate figures, um, which I just use a screen capture from the app to generate figures. Okay. So uh, that was a tour sort of through the website. If you have an experiment or region of interest and you want to get, you know, use the data visualization tools, that's how you do it. But of course, these things are also available informatically. Uh, the raw images and segmentation masks through the API. And then the grid data and the unionizes are available through both the API and the SDK. Um, but I recommend using the SDK if possible. Uh, unless you're just really familiar with RMA queries. So I'm going to talk a little bit just about the API and the API and SDK. And we're still under the use case where you sort of know which experiment or subsets of experiments you're interested in. Um, so our API, there, there's some information uh, at this URL here at help.brainmap.org. And I am going to, at the end of the talk, sort of give you a, a big picture overview of how to find help. Um, but so, you know, hopefully we'll be able to find all of these things, but I'm also trying to include these links throughout the talk. Um, also, at this, at this API help page, you'll find some limited MATLAB code snippets. Uh, we do not have a lot of MATLAB support. You should probably consider switching to Python, just, just my personal opinion. Uh, I did it. It was painful, but it's, it's great now. Um, however, if you want to use RMA queries, you can, and I do. Um, I like to just keep a few on hand that are really helpful. 
Uh, the one I get asked about a lot is how do we find the structure sets? You don't necessarily want every structure in the atlas for every experiment. And so we have curated some sets of structures. And if you don't know what that means or which one you want, uh, start with this one. This is what we call our, our summary structures or manually annotated set of non-overlapping structures at a mid ontology level. Um, but also using these queries, you can, you can download images or you can get unionized data. And so basically you're gonna build your query like this and then just copy and paste it into your browser window and it'll download for you, or of course, integrate it into your code uh, if you know how to do that. Um, if you want to use the, the Allen Software Development Kit or SDK, uh, there's, uh, again, I'll give you a link at the end to find more information online, but um, you're gonna pip install the Allen SDK and then import the mouse connectivity cache. And the mouse connectivity cache, after you initialize it, has a lot of methods that are just useful for getting all sorts of connectivity information. And so you'll be able to get you know, unionized data. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it on the next page. All the other data with basically one line queries. So we have an example Jupyter Notebook um, online in our documentation about the Allen SDK. Uh, and then also you can look at the mouse connectivity cache code directly through our GitHub. All right, so um, as I mentioned, you probably want to use the API if you want raw images and segmentation masks. Um, and the SDK is really useful for getting grid data and unionized data. Um, and so we have things like get injection density, get projection density, get experiment structure unionizes. And again, if you know your experiment ID, you just plug it right in and you'll get it. Or if you have a list of experiment IDs, um, and in some of the example Jupyter notebooks, it tells you how to find the experiment IDs informatically that you want. We've got about 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, so um, of course, the, one of the big advantages of this data set is that all of these experiments are registered to the CCF, right? So even though every injection happens in a separate animal, we can sort of treat them as though they're samples taken from the same uh, informatically registered CCF brain. Uh, and so uh, there are some applications where you can use just a, a lot of connectivity data from a variety of different um, source injections. And one example of that is the virtual mouse brain. Um, and so this was developed by Christoph Bernard's lab. And this is a, an open source simulation software that you can use for whole mouse brain network modeling. And it models structural connectivity and functional connectivity. And it's built off of the experiments in the Allen Mouse Brain Connectivity Atlas. Uh, so also if you're interested in what, you know, ways that we uh, analyze large groups of experiments in, in bulk or like the types of questions you can ask, um, these two recent papers that I mentioned before, the Harris et al. paper from 2019 and my paper that is available on BioArchive, go through a couple specific examples of like how, to, how we've matched experiments together and aggregated them and made comparisons and drawn conclusions. Okay, but I do want to point out an important um, thing that you need to consider when looking at, at connectivity matrices. And that is that uh, if you look at a stereotaxic injection, which is represented here by this sort of green blob, it's not gonna be a perfect circle. It's never gonna align perfectly with voxels. And it's also never going to align perfectly with our regional parcellations. So if this oval is a region and these um, boxes are voxels and this is an injection experiment, clearly these things are not the same. And so we have, we have you know, a, we need to solve for the fact that these injections vary in volume that there are gaps between them and that we can register the data into voxel coordinates, but this, the data is undetermined. And so it's difficult to, um, to expand this basically to the entire brain. And so the way that we've solved this problem is to assume smoothness, smoothness at least across major divisions. So for instance, across the isocortex, across the hippocampus, and then hard boundaries between these major divisions. Uh, and then we just perform a distance dependent interpolation. And that allows us to model the connectivity from every voxel, basically based on interpolating between the nearest actual injection experiments. Uh, so then we can, using this model, we can basically project, uh, I'm sorry, generate the 
anticipated projections from every voxel. And I'm just showing you a movie here, which is sort of like a scene pixel correlation, but is structural connectivity, not functional connectivity. So uh, using this method, what, is, what we did is we went from this, in, this experimental matrix where each row is an injection experiment, and then the columns are regions, to a voxel-wise matrix, which can then be aggregated into a regional matrix. And in this case, these sources are actually regions, and the targets are also regions. And so sources and targets are the same. Uh, you can find the code for this uh, on our GitHub. Uh, and this, you know, it's a useful model, I think. Um, I recommend that you use it. Please note that there was a model included in the original paper, but um, we have upgrade, updated it since then. And um, we also made some comparisons between different types of models, these two different types of models, in this Knox et al. 2018 paper. So check that out if you're interested in it. So now, um, once we have a matrix in which sources and targets the same, are the same, we can then take this connectivity representation and uh, look at it as a set of nodes and edges. So each node here is a region, and each edge is its uh, outgoing and incoming connections. And note that this is a weighted directed matrix uh, and a, therefore a weighted directed graph. And once you have a weighted directed graph, you can do a lot of graph theory analyses. Uh, in the Harris et al. paper, we did um, a modularity analysis, but there's a, a variety of different things that you can do with this. And there are many, many examples in the literature of this connectivity model being used uh, for different analyses. Um, I do want to point out that a lot of them used our older data, so please check out the Knox et al. paper if you're interested in doing that, or also just send us a message if you're interested in, in working on this, and we'll help you figure out the right data to use. All right, so I want to end by summarizing some of the resources I've talked about here and helping you hopefully find what you need. Um, of course, uh, brain-map.org is the main entry point for the Allen Institute for Brain Science. And if you go to brain-map.org, scroll way, way down to the bottom, you'll see this little icon that says toolkit. And so then if you click on toolkit, and again, scroll way, 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 way down until you get to software. Uh, and then in here, you're gonna find links to basically everything you need, the software development kit, the GitHub, uh, the Allen SDK, different toolboxes. The thing that you're not gonna find here is API. But other than that, you should be able to find the links that you need uh, just by navigating through our main entry site. Uh, the Allen SDK um, link is here. And as I mentioned, there's a Jupyter notebook that has connectivity examples. Also, if you check us out on GitHub, there's several uh, repositories that are useful. Of course, the Allen SDK. Also, there's this SFN 2017 connectivity repository, which is another example Jupyter notebook um, that goes through a lot of the basics for accessing data. And then finally, the, you'll find the mouse connectivity models code here. Um, also, if you have a question, go first to this community forum because we may have answered it already. Uh, this is community.brain-map.org. Uh, and then if your question you know, isn't answered there, you can post it and, or you can always, of course, click send us a message. So I wanna thank you for your attention. And of course, uh, we're very grateful to Paul Allen and the Allen Institute um, for his vision, encouragement and support. And this, Mouse Brain Connectivity Atlas was created by hundreds of scientists, engineers, software developers, and support staff over more than 10 years. And so I just want to thank everybody who has contributed to this project. And thank you to Saskia, Anton, and Nuno for the opportunity to participate in this workshop and to CNS for hosting it. So, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, a uh, uh, couple of questions. Um, so. You mentioned that if one wants to access the data programmatically, we one needs to to have the experimental ID. What happens if uh, if if when when there is a one has a particular particular question uh, like which areas project to area X, but uh, that does not does not does not know the experimental ID? Can can one does that all programmatically or? one does have to go to the to, to first to the interface find out which which uh, which 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 areas are in the experiment and then um yeah that's a great question i actually did not cover how to do um searching based on target but that is a thing that you can do 
Um, so first of all, through the, through the SDK, you can uh, just download a big list of all experiments or a list of all experiments by region or by projection region or by um, Cree line by a whole bunch of different, um, you know, the search parameters. Um, but then also you can just download the unionized data directly. You'll have the, the quantified projection density. And then you could, for instance, like sort the experiments by the strength of their projection to your region of interest. Um, so I would say, yes, there are, there are many, many ways to do this informatically. You do not have to go to the website to do these searches. However, I do recommend to computational people that if something looks weird or if you think an experiment looks a little funny, just copy that experiment ID, go to the website and just look at it. Um, it's always a good tip, but no, you do not have to start at all with the, the website tools. And, and w one other question, Jennifer, is, is there a clear relationship between the, 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 the volume or the number of voxels in the injection site and the number of voxels on the target region? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so I mentioned that we manually annotate the injection site. And one of the reasons for that is that then we can normalize the projections to the size of the injection. So a bigger injection is just going to have more projections. More cells are gonna be labeled and you're gonna get more brain-wide projections. And um, the way that we have addressed that is, is again, by normalizing to injection site. Um, you can also, for instance, normalize uh, as a, a fraction of the whole brain projections to each region, which we've, we've done as well. So just look at how many total projections from the experiment and what percent of them go to each area. Um, and these are these are the important caveats, I think, to keep in mind when using using these data, basically, that injection, there this is experimental data. Injections are different sizes, and they're never going to overlap 100%. And so the voxel model is an attempt to sort of, another attempt to, to normalize for that. Uh, and th there's just, there's a bunch of different things we've tried, and we continue to work on this. OK. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, our next speaker, which is a, a great follow up from 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 uh, from Jennifer, is is uh, Stefan uh, uh, Michalos. Um, and uh, and and uh, Stefan, uh, or is it, has a PhD from the California Institute of Technology. Okay. Then he moved to a postdoc in John Hopkins, and from then to the institute where he's been since 2011 is an um, associate investigator at the Allen Institute. And he has been involved and led many of the um, analysis efforts at uh, the Institute, analyzing the Institute data, and also integrating this data into to generate meaningful models of, uh, of, 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 of the brain. Um, is uh, today is, is going to talk about this cortical hierarchical organized set of canonical local circuits or not? Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Sounds great. So um, today I'm going to talk about a um, principle of anatomical organization, which we uh, characterized mathematically in the uh, in the mouse brain. I'm going to begin a little bit more general, as the idea, this being a computational neuroscience conference where this workshop is focused on data, we also want to think on integrating them into models of cortical processing. And I want to emphasize that there are three incredibly important types of data which need to be considered when uh, one wants to constrain a model of cortical processing, and they are structural data, activity data, and task data. We need all of them in order to be in order to be able to create uh, to create good models of cortical pro of cortical processing. And very often it is referred to structure and function, but I want to divide function in two parts, one which represents activity of the neurons and the other is activity at the level of a circuit or a computational principle which needs to be to also be included. 
Uh, one thing which is very important for us to realize is that the cortex is an incredibly uh, complex system. Uh, for mice, for example, there is an average of 10 to the 12 synapses. For a human, that is to the order of 10 to the 15 synapses. And if we just consider just a few bytes associated with with every synapse in order to be able to in order to be able to map, for example, neuron IDs, the idea is that that information is ridiculously large. The amount of synaptic information present in the human brain is, of course, much, much larger than the mouse brain. But even a mouse brain is similar in order of magnitude to the total information which is present in the Library of Congress, such that the question of taking data directly and putting it into models should be taken very much with a grain of salt. We know that there are somewhat simpler representations because even at the level of the DNA, the complexity which is present, the information which is present to build this structure, this uh, human brain is actually much, much lower. It is not the amount of, to of total information which is present is not so high such that we can extract, we can think of going to build uh, models of cortical processing, not by directly uh, taking data, and integrating it in, into models, but I want to emphasize an additional step which is needed, going from data to some level of knowledge or principles about structure activity and tasks which are needed before they are integrated at the level of cortical processing. Of course, I uh, have a background in physics and mathematics, and the first time when I talk about these things, when principles, I cannot not bring this up, which is the idea that it is possible to oversimplify, that it is very likely that the first time a physicist moves to biology, the first model might be a little bit too simplistic. We need to think at models at multiple levels of resolution, and sometimes models which are oversimplified are useful to extract some principles, but we also need to look at multiple, uh, at knowledge at multiple levels to extract these principles in order to have the right level of resolution which is needed to be able to capture and relate structure, activity, and task. In the past, I have been talking quite a lot and the central part of my group is focused on models of local circuits. Uh, we have done that at multiple levels of resolution, at the higher level of resolution, in collaboration with Anton Arkipov's group and uh, Yezan Bila, but I do, uh, will hear ab about these efforts uh, later in this workshop. We also have done this at a level which is much uh, higher in terms of uh, a, a much uh, simplified level of resolution in which the structure is reduced at some levels of principles and like-to-like -like connections between excitatory and inhibitory neurons looking at extra classical receptive fields mm -hmm. as a task for the local circuit is to have optimal integration of context and we have some very nice results on convolutional neuronal networks with extra classical receptive fields being able to show advances compared to typical uh, uh, networks like this. But today, I want to focus on a very different scale, not at the scale of the local circuit, but rather to try to see, is it possible to look for principles of structural organization at a global, at a system, at a system level? And today's talk, I'm not going to talk about modeling. I am going to focus primarily on how can we get from data to principles at the level of structure. I'm going to talk a little bit about how this relates to similar uh, elements at the, uh, done at the level of activity and just only going to mention task in passing because a colleague uh, later in the um, workshop is probably going to come back and uh, touch uh, based on it. So the basic microstructure of the cortex is very similar across area. We have known uh, this for quite some time, and it is quite interesting that it is relatively similar across species as well. However, the global structure of this, uh, of this network is highly complex. So that is where the main uh, part of the talk it is going to be today is, um, can we discuss on principles of organization? 
pr the probably the best known principle of organization of cortical structure are, have been described by Fellman and Van Essen uh, in the past, and it is the idea of hierarchy. How does the hierarchy works? Is that if you assume that there is a hierarchy and you look at the uh, connections which are going to go up in the hierarchy, they have a particular set of patterns. They are going. Uh, they are going to. Uh, they are going to terminate primarily in the middle layers, in uh, granular layers. In layer four, the lateral connections are going to be columnar, and uh, the descending or feedback pathways are going to terminate primarily in the superficial and deep layers. Now, if you assume that these patterns map to the feed forward lateral and feedback, you can look where they appear and come up with an organization of the with an organization of the cortical structure. The only problem for this when looking at this a little bit better is that this is a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Is that if you define the types of connections which are going to be feed forward lateral and feedback, you can find the hierarchy. If you define the hierarchy, you can find what patterns are um, feed forward, lateral, and feedback. So the question which it is, can we try to solve this problem fully rather than uh, going around in circle in a chicken and egg type of problem as to which came first, to try to solve this problem um, in a systematic uh, and mathematically driven manner? So the main question which I'm going to try to address in this talk is can we quantify how hierarchi hierarchical is the mouse corticothalamic system? Uh, I have been incredibly lucky to be joined in uh, this uh, project by a fantastic applied mathematician, Hannah Choi, which uh, had uh, considerable contributions towards everything which I'm going to include uh, in, the, uh, in this talk. The data which uh, is used in order to try to, uh, to ask this question is the Allen uh, Mouse Brain Connectivity Atlas. And it is great that I do not need to go towards uh, this pipeline because Jennifer has been describing it very well. I just want to mention a uh, uh, large, team which has been contributed to this. There are, there are, I think, on the order of 80 authors on these types of papers which appear, which appear from this. But uh, I want to bring up a special uh, few contributors, Julie Harris, Jennifer Whitesell, Carla Hirokawa, and Hong Kui Zhang. Um, the data which we are going to use for these uh, um, analysis focuses on uh, cortical and thalamic uh, tracing and they include they are very dense throughout multiple areas we will focus on the data which is driven by uh, pre driver mouse lines in order to uh, in order to create uh, multiple types of projections and i want to say that very often in the past when characterizing connections in the brain, uh, graph theory has been used. And that has uh, created a lot of very interesting models and characterization, and there are very useful uh, tools which came out of it. But graph theory only assigns the connection to one particular weight. Sometimes in, uh, it can be uh, just the, the presence of a connection of weight. However, um, the most important principles of organization, for example, like hierarchy, are not driven by the weight of connections. The weight of feed forward and feedback connections are relatively similar uh, in uh, brain structure. What is different is the exact layer pattern of uh, how these are distributed. And what we want to search is how these different layer pattern distribution are forming not one set of connections between areas, but multiple types of connections. And that is very 
important to realize that we know we need to move away from graph theoretical analysis of, connect, uh, of connectivity to multigraph theory. And uh, this uh, study, which I'm talking about, it's a um, beginning, it's just the beginning of such, an, uh, of such a theoretical development of multigraphs to characterize the brain structure. So the first element which is uh, important to characterize at this level is what are the types of connections? We used the layer distribution of the connections in order and a um, um, clustering algorithm in order to characterize the type of connections which are present. It was nice to be able to co-cluster thalamic and cortical sources. And we have obtained uh, at this level uh, it, um, verified by anatomical intuition that nine clusters represent uh, relatively well the distribution of what has been pre what has been present in the data. Beyond the uh, cortical layer distribution, um, there are uh, elements which need to be present in terms of uh, uh, they need to uh, we, we need to talk about the corticothalamic projections as well, and from uh, that we have been able to use a supervised learning algorithm in order to be able to characterize projections going from cortex to thalamus based on differential strengths of the layer five versus layer six uh, connection, connection strengths. So after we have types of connections characterized, the question we is, uh, which is present is what is up, uh, what is down? So for that, what we want to do is to search all the maps between layer termination patterns and assign a possible direction for this. Each of these particular patterns can be assigned a direction up or down in the hierarchy. And um, then in order to be able to um, define is it uh, better to be characterized as a feed-forward connection or is it better to be characterized as a feedback connection? What we are doing is defining a hierarchy level for each area, which is simply going to be the question of how many feed-forward connections you get. If you receive a lot of feed-forward connections, you're going to be higher in the hierarchy. If you receive a lot of feedback connections, you're going to be lower. In the connection uh, in the hierarchy as a target. If you send a lot of feed forward uh, connections, uh, then you're probably going to be lower. If you're going to uh, send a lot of feedback connections, you can be higher. And a global hierarchy score, which simply asks how self consistent are these organizational patterns? Pretty much, how often are we going to see an error that if we define a connection, a direction as being up, if we move, if we see another connection uh, via an intermediary area, will it be defined still as up in this level of the hierarchy? Having this global hierarchy score, we can run a global optimization and try to see simultaneously uh, what are the assignments for the connectivity which is present at the level of uh, the assignment for a particular connection to a feed forward or a feedback and the hierarchy score for each area. We have found that the most self-consistent maps are found when we assign three of these um, connection patterns to feedback connection types and see uh, six of them to feed forward when looking at the cortical-cortical mapping. And one of these pathways changes sign if we are trying to look at the thalamocortical mapping. I have to say that uh, this, is an, this was a relatively complicated search, but it didn't prove sufficient. What we wanted to do is to iterate this hierarchy um, to uh, 
refine this hierarchy um, via an iteration mm -hmm. by simply assigning and saying that if you receive a feed forward connection from an area which is high up in the hierarchy, it adds even higher level to your score, such that mm -hmm. the hierarchy level of your source and your target are included. And this iterated algorithm is run up until it converges. In order to make sure that uh, these uh, elements do not find, uh, that this algorithm does not find a hierarchy by chance, uh, we worked in, uh, in order to define a null distribution for, uh, for what can happen in an experiment like this, uh, simply by shuffling uh, the uh, type of connection which has been assigned. And we have observed that the mouse uh, brain hierarchy is significantly above what can be obtained by chance during experiments. And we have exact data for what is the hierarchy present throughout the entirety of the corticothalamic system. Um, what is important to realize is that hierarchy is not the only organi uh, organizational principle. There are multiple other principles, mostly which are based on uh, graph theory, for example, which can be done. Jennifer has run a fantastic modularity analysis to show that uh, this, uh, the structure of the uh, brain connectivity is highly modular. But uh, these can be intersected. We can try to look at the hierarchy which is present between modules and what is the hierarchy which is going to present uh, present of a uh, different area within a module. So the question which is going to be next is some of these relatively simple principles which have been extracted from the, uh, court, uh, from the anatomy the principle of hierarchy, the exact location in the hierarchy with the different strengths and the type of connections, are they related to the activity which is present? We started doing this work and that is uh, uh, look, uh, based on the physiology data set, which has not been introduced, but it is probably going to be discussed much more extensively in the next few days. I'm only going to mention briefly fantastic work coming from George Siegel, Shaojan Jia, and Sean Olson on uh, trying to uh, look at a very large population of cells using electrophysiology uh, throughout multiple throughout multiple areas. And I'm just shy of 10 minutes. Thank you. And uh, looking at the correlation between anatomical and physiological hierarchy, using different measures. One of the first measures for hierarchy vision is the functional delay, which is present if you simply drive the system with a flashed image. And we constructed this matrix is organized by the anatomical hierarchy score. And when putting in the same matrix, the median functional delay um, for each individual pair of areas, we observe a very high correlation between the anatomically defined hierarchy, which is simply defined in terms of types of connections between areas, and the functional delay, which has been observed in physiological experiments. But functional delays are only one measure of hierarchy. Uh, Based on this data, in collaboration with Josh or Sean, Sean um, we have looked at several other measures on how they correlate to the hierarchy, which is time to first spikes, receptor field area, modulation index of the cells. And in all cases, the principle of the anatomical connections produce a very strong correlation with physiology. One of the things which impressed me by far the most was not only the fact that these predict what is going to be present in an activity which has been measured in a passive task, but uh, Sam Gale and Corbin Bennett have been running uh, great experiments using the similar type of pipeline 
to uh, do this during a presence of a task. And this anatomical structure continues to present uh, basic physiological measures during this task as well, like a time to first plank, which has been seen before. But much more interestingly, it relates to the behavior of the animal as well, such that this is not simply a um, result of the feed forward processing through the first few layers. The uh, behavioral um, elements are going to be related to um, uh, the depths of the hierarchy. The change modulation index, which is the key element on solving this task, is correlated to hierarchy and dependent on the animal performing the task, as is our capacity uh, to predict the mouse behavior in which it is much more likely to predict the true mouse behavior when looking at areas which are higher up in the hierarchy versus area low in the hierarchy have, uh, have very little predictive power of behavior. In the end, I want to go towards elements where, which are not done yet. They are work in progress and it is the question of thinking about incorporating uh, elements like these between structure and activity which task-driven models, which is a project which I'm pursuing together with Michael Weiss. And what we are trying to do is trying to see if we can relate at a global perspective, sub-networks which are extracted from visual processing from the type of work which I have been talking about with task training of the data in order to see if we can predict the statistics of the activity which are observed in the uh, in uh, the cortex. In summary, what I have talked to you today, I presented a new unsupervised method to uncover the hierarchical organization of the mouth and co uh, cortical and thalamic network, which is based on the anatomy. The global hierarchy score on self-consistency measure uh, indicates that a uh, mouse uh, brain is indeed hierarchical. Um, we can use such a measure to quantify, not only to say that it is hierarchical and statistically above significant, but it is, but to try to put a, a quantitative measure of how hierarchical the structure is. And it would be interesting to make a comparison with other uh, brain structure. Um, the hierarchical structure may implicate the directionality of information flow in the brain. Uh, the connections of functional hierarchy uh, to functional hierarchy, which are based on neuropixels data. And a little bit with a question mark is the question of, can we try to incorporate these principles of structural connectivity with ideas of task training to try to build better functional models of the, uh, of the cortex. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Paul Allen for uh, his vision, encouragement and support and to say that a lot of these results are the result are coming from team efforts at Allen Institute. There are very large team which have uh, uh, important contributions to multiple aspects of the uh, of the work and I have only been able to mention a few key people but there are many other elements of uh, many other members of the team which have brought which have been incredibly important to be able to uh, realize this type of data sets which we can make uh, use of now thank you thanks so much uh, Stefan um... Again, I, I would say that we encourage uh, questions from the audience, but uh, I have a few of uh, I have a few of regarding some things that you said, and maybe starting with something that you had your summary, and 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 I'm curious if, if you if you applied your method to to extract this hierarchy to the original kind of to the data that was original primate data that was originally used on the diagram of. Uh, of uh, Feldman and Vanessa, and, and if and if yes, if that if it, it came up with the same kind of um, kind of uh, hierarchy. 
we have limited time and capacity to do this. And uh, I want to say that our capacity to do this type of analysis is highly dependent on the tools which have been presented before. None of this work would have worked without Lydia's work on uh, being able to register all of these connections. We used layer dependent connectivity in an informatic manner, which was connected, which was done using the tools which were presented by Lydia. We used a lot of this. I have not seen these type of tools present on the mouse brain, the one the, on the uh, on other on other types of brains, such that uh, building them is beyond what we can do. Uh, we are sim simply a group more of mathematicians and theorists to do that. The informatic support to be able to do that is really lacking for, for other places. Uh, though we have given the algorithm to do it to a group which is planning to apply it to macaque data, but I have not seen the results yet. And, and one other question, one, is, um, one interesting aspect of the, of the, the, of the mouse is that th there seems to be a lot of lateral kind of connections as well, and 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 I wonder in your analysis in relating the anatomy with the with the physiology data, it's where 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 are the where are the the do, do areas that have extensive lateral connections are coactive or wh where do they wh where are they located in those uh, in those in that relationship that you that you showed. So this is just the beginning of more complex types of multigraph analysis. The current work has focused on feed forward and feedback connections. And we started with this absolutely minimalist approach. It was closer to the circle in terms of which was present which was presented in the beginning in terms of how much can we abstract away of the data. I hope that there are going to be multiple iterations to talk about the density of particular lateral connections and other iterations to add more level of details, but I do not have an answer for that yet. We have only looked at feed forward and feedback. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Stefan. Thank you. And uh, our final uh, speaker of today is again an external user of the Allen Institute data. It's Eva Dyer. Uh, from uh, Georgia Tech. Um, Eva, Eva is an assistant professor uh, in, the, in the biomedical engineer at uh, Georgia Tech. She has originally a PhD and, and master on the electrical and computer engineer from Rice University. And her, her, her work really focuses on this intersection between neuroscience and neuroscience data, like the one that's been presented before, and, and, and machine learning and uh, developing computational tools to interpret the systems, um, the, the, the neural systems. Um, and uh, uh, today um, she's gonna, I think she's gonna touch on these aspects and the title of her talk is, uh, well, change a bit, multi-scale maps of brain structures and organization. Um, thanks so much for participating, Eva, and uh, look forward to your talk. Great, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. Yeah, thanks so much, Nunu, uh, Suski, and Anton for the, uh, for the invitation to come and speak at this workshop. I'm really excited to talk to you all today about work that we've been doing, as Nunu said, at the interface of um, neuroanatomical data and a lot of open access data sets and machine learning and how we can actually draw inferences and understand um, underlying structures from these large scale data sets. So with that, I'll just sort of start by um, motivating a, a lot of the work that we do in my lab has sort of um, come out of this uh, you know, boom of new data collection methods and the ability to now acquire information from the brain, both at very high resolution and also at very large scales. And I think you know, the Allen Institute is really at the forefront of being able to scale up a lot of these data generation pipelines and also informatics pipelines required to be able to start to make sense of these sorts of data sets. So here I'm just showing a few examples of some of the data sets that we're working on in, uh, in my lab. And I'll talk about two projects in particular. One of them is using the Allen Institute's uh, Mass Connectivity Atlas. And the other is using a now publicly available data set coming from high energy x-rays which is also compatible with electron microscopy, um, similar to some of the things that you know Nunu and folks at 
the Allen work on as well. So some of the overarching aims once we have these large scale data sets is often to try to find some way to learn or extract patterns of variability often across many samples. So this could be something like, you know, um, understanding structure across different individuals. Maybe it's across different disease states, say Alzheimer's or, um, or healthy brains. Um, or we could even look at patterns of variability that may exist within a given brain region um, if there's some underlying microarchitectural differences, for instance. Um, in order to learn these patterns of variability from, from many brain samples, often we have to start with you know, extracting whatever are the relevant features that we need from the data in order to then learn these patterns of variability. So in order to extract these features of maybe standard kind of brain mapping pipeline um, in terms of informatics might proceed as sort of shown here in this slide. So we start with images. We're often, depending on the question that we're asking, you know, whether it be, um, is this brain area A or B? Is this an axon or not, right? Uh, is this healthy or diseased uh, specimen? Um, depending on what we want to ask, we'll start with images, maybe form some sort of informatics to segment or pull out those structures from the data in order to then form some abstraction, um, which then helps us to solve this prediction task. So for instance, an abstraction could be something like cell density or some other measure that we know should be meaningful for um, making a given prediction of interest. And so, you know, this is, of course, a, a very powerful strategy when we know exactly what we need to segment or maybe what abstraction we want to form. Um, but a sort of, you know, emerging question, especially when it comes to really big data sets, is, um, you know, what if we don't already know the underlying features or the abstraction and segmentation that we need to pull out from this data? And in this case, we're um, faced with the question of whether or not we can learn directly from these images to sort of go directly to prediction. And so um, deep learning, you know, may provide a solution to this. And um, it's been shown to be a, a, a very powerful strategy for automatically extracting features from images to drive predictions, um, given, you know, this sort of uh, underlying nonlinear architecture that it, it's embedded in. It allows you to just learn features directly from data. However, when we um, go all the way to, you know, using a neural network or deep learning to solve this sort of challenge, we're still faced with the question of, you know, wanting some intuition or understanding of what it's telling us, right? And I think the key thing is, is, you know, we'd like to be able to learn all these features, but we still want some low dimensional readout or some way to interpret the underlying predictions. So what I'll talk about now are two different ways in which we're both trying to develop deep learning strategies to essentially learn these features from neuroanatomical data sets in a data-driven way, and also think about ways that we can open up these black boxes and start to interpret the underlying predictions therein. So this first project, what I'll, I'll, I'll talk about here is um, sort of zooming in. So first we'll talk about the micro scale. And um, in particular, uh, what we're visualizing here in this slide is a fly through of a large thalamocortical section um, from the mouse brain. This has been imaged with X-ray microtomography at very high resolution. So using a synchrotron X-ray source at the Argonne National Lab, we achieve about one micron isotropic pixel resolution. So the the because this is tomography, the the section is intact, and we can actually, um, you know, zoom through this section without having to section it. And you know, some of the the sizes here are shown below on the slide. In its longest dimension, it's about seven millimeters. And within this data, we can see um, cell bodies, individual nuclei. In white, we're seeing myelinated axons that are moving through um, from, the, from the thalamus, so the VP region of thalamus through striatum and then into somatosensory cortex. So um, with this data, we actually have a very rich picture of, um, of architecture, both at the micron scale and also across many different brain regions. 
So if we zoom in a little bit further, um, we can start to further, you know, see what makes brain regions distinct in this particular data set. So we were interested in whether or not we could first train a neural network to be able to distinguish different brain regions, given these sort of localized views of the microarchitecture. And then we wanted to take it a step further to really understand what are the features that are being extracted from this neural network. And Eva, I might have missed it, but yes. is, this, is this rat or is mouse? Oh, this is all mouse. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and so to do this, we developed a method or approach that we call deep brain disco or deep brain discovery. Um, essentially, the idea is to uh, take out small little snapshots from different brain regions that have been um, labeled ahead of time. Um, they're, in this case, roughly about 150 microns by 150 micron little patches within the, within the brain. And now we are going to train this neural network, in this case, a convolutional neural network, to be able to distinguish between these six different brain regions using just the image data directly. And so we can train this neural network to solve this classification task. Um, and, and what we see is that we can actually, you know, train this network to um, very effectively be able to predict these six different brain regions on held out data. I'm not going to go into the details of that result, but um, what I will talk about is how we can then go into the neural network and use it actually as a feature extractor. And that feature extractor provides a lot of additional information about the underlying images that it sees that might not have been embedded within the training process. So essentially what, that, what happens is I'm going to feed in an image. I'm going to now pull out the activations within the neural network within the, the last hidden layer before the final output. It's a 64 dimensional representation. And now I can basically accumulate many of these representations for different um, brain region samples and stack them into this matrix, which I'm showing here on top. Um, and then once we have those representations, our next step is to try to see what lies within them. <laughs> so what I'm showing on the right is just if we take representations and embed them into a three-dimensional space, we see that all the brain regions are sort of separated from each other. But what's interesting is that, you know, regions that actually share a lot of similarities in the, their microarchitecture have been placed closer to each other, like cortex and stratum. Um, and then regions that are heavily innervated with white matter, like the zona inserta or the thalamus, are also placed in a different portion of this sort of low dimensional feature space. And uh, more information on this and code and visualizations are all provided on our GitHub shown here on the bottom and we have a bioarchive preprint out. Okay, so what we do next is we take these representations and now we um, basically look at the embedding along different factors after factorizing the representations, in this case using, uh, sorry, not principal components analysis, but using non-negative matrix factorization. So we take the factors, we re-rotate them using NMF. And now what I'm showing here is if we take a full thalamocortical section spanning all the way from hypothalamus up to cortex, and we look at the embedding or the representations of each of these factors and where they sort of highlight or um, localized within the, within the brain sample. So I guess as expected, we do find that there are factors that are heavily sort of localized within a given brain region, which is perhaps to be expected because we've trained this network to be able to divide things into different brain regions. But then we also find some other interesting things where you know a factor which is actually tuned to underlying microstructure therein um, will also highlight other regions, perhaps not where, um, you know, it's been trained to, to combine uh, those, those parts of space. So for instance, if we look here at this third factor, um, which is, you know, both highlighting parts of the thalamus and also parts of zona inserta, which are heavily innervated with diffuse white matter, but also have a certain 
amount of uh, cellular density. If we zoom into this further, we actually find that within cortex, namely in layers four and six, we also see sort of um, highlighting of these regions, and those do correspond to regions with higher white matter um, counts in, in the cortex in comparison to the other layers. And we can also see here along the top that we do see some laminar differences that are starting to be revealed through this sort of analysis. We wanted to zoom into that further. Um, and what I'm showing here is just um, taking now um, patches from all six layers of cortex, um, from pia down to white matter. And now I'm visualizing the sort of embeddings of different parts of these corte cortical um, images in terms of these different factors. And on the left, I'm just showing a sort of merged colorized representation. So um, we have, you know, analyzed this to the extent of, you know, starting to see these laminar differences and in particular starting to zoom in further and find um, barrels which have been highlighted by this particular method. So we can see here in factor 14, um, the, the highlighting of, of barreloids actually in this case where there are region um, spar or the cell sparse regions of interest. Um, and then just kind of zooming in a little bit further, we find that specific factors highlight different cellular densities. And so um, we can use this then to actually find hotspots where there are high or lower cell, cell density. And that also allows us to see these barrels versus barreloids within the cortex. Um, and this is just noting that, you know, the, the model has just been told to tell the difference between cortex and other regions, but it hasn't actually been told explicitly about, you know, cellular density or some of these concepts that it seems to be pulling out to solve this particular problem. All right. So um, we can also combine this network with a pixel level segmentation, and these are still um, wor work in, in preparation, but we can basically create this multitask architecture that can both you know, find brain regions, as I've described before, um, find differences therein, and also solve this pixel level segmentation to pull out things like myelinated axons, blood vessels, and cells. And so we're hoping to bring all this together into a more interpretable um, model that allows us to read out very specific information from um, these different brain regions. We have um, produced a publicly available data set containing all these images, region level annotations, microstructure annotations, and this is being hosted um, through the BOSS. Um, uh, so there's basically a way of scrolling through the data and you have a, a neuroglancer link to, to zoom through and, and visualize these different annotations as well. All right. So um, with that, that sort of brings me to the, the end of this first part of the talk, which um, you know, I described as sort of focusing in on microstructure and how we can tell differences between different brain regions um, automatically through this sort of deep learning strategy. And so in this next part, I'm going to ask a sort of more macro scale question, which is, can we understand what makes different brains distinct? So this is a question of individual variability. And um, really the goal here is to, again, put in a collection of images and figure out what's shared and, and what's variable across them. And a, a sort of motivi uh, motivating application is um, towards disease mapping. And this is just an example from Jen Whitesell's paper um, showing you know, the, the presence of plaques. So if we could potentially learn a model of what a healthy brain looks like, then we might be able to give a more um, you know, uh, data-driven understanding of what's changing in these brains during disease. So that's sort of the sort of motivating application. And to do that, um, we are interested in building what's called a generative model of brain structure. And so the, the idea is sort of moving away from, you know, this idea of just being able to discriminate or saying, you know, disease or not disease. Um, but instead, if, if, if we have a model that can build a new example 
of what a healthy brain looks like, then it has to learn a lot more about the underlying structure and the data in order to make that possible. And so essentially this generative model, right, wants to capture the distribution of the data. And so that gives us a model of individual differences. And then we can also then use that model to do things like diagnosis by asking what is the probability of this new sample, right? And the idea would be, if it doesn't look like most brains, then it might live in the tail of this distribution. All right, so deep learning is now being used to learn um, to learn this sort of idea of a generative model, but from very high dimensional data. The idea is sort of shown here in this picture where you have you know, a lot of pictures of faces, you learn this sort of assumed distribution, so this blue space. And then um, you can actually generate new samples that you might not have seen before by just drawing a sample from this underlying distribution. Um, this has been used a lot in the computer vision uh, literature, you know, for doing things like generating new scenes or creating anime characters, which is a lot of fun. And uh, more recently, you know, the medical imaging community has started to use this now for doing a number of things like data augmentation, um, which can improve then tumor detection performance, for instance, in this example on the right. So we were interested in whether or not we could use this sort of approach to learn to generate brains at higher resolution. And so we um, started by, you know, examining or uh, we, we wanted to apply this idea to the Allen Institute's Mouse Connectivity Atlas. And in particular, instead of using the green channel or instead of using the viral tracing information that's provided um, to map out these connections in the brain, we were actually interested in learning a model of how the gross anatomy across brains might be changing. So we actually used um, the autofluorescence channel or the another channel of, of these data sets to learn this to learn this underlying um, in individual variability distribution. And so what I'm showing here on the right are some examples of brains that we can generate with this model. Um, I'll dig into that a bit more. Um, and then on the left, I'm just showing an example from the average template of this same section. So we're just using this for now on 2D sections and trying to synthesize brains, even though, of course, the MCA is actually three-dimensional. And, um, and then just showing some a few key brain regions that are sort of highlighted within this particular section. In addition, on the bottom here, I'm just showing a few examples of, um, of some brains that either have, you know, a signal that's bleeding over into the red channel from these viral tracing experiments as shown on the bottom left, um, or perhaps other physical sectioning or other artifacts. The reason why I point this out is it's a very small amount of the data set, but when using models like um, principal components analysis, which is driven by variance, oftentimes you end up you know, uh, capturing these um, artifacts or modes of variance which actually aren't biological in nature. And so we need a model that can generate brains, but also understand when things are sort of improbable, which is what I showed before. We do this by um, using what's called a beta VAE model or variational autoencoder. Essentially, the idea is to take, you know, images and push them down through a sort of bottleneck into a lower dimensional space shown here in the middle, this latent space. Um, and then you expand back out in order to, um, in order to decode these, these images at the output. And so the goal is to basically capture the distribution over the inputs, P of X, at your output of your decoder. So those are your generated output images. So we train this model, we could confirm that it actually recapitulates data very well, and it also could denoise um, data in terms of removing certain artifacts from it. But then our next question was, you know, okay, so we have this model and it can, it can capture information about many brains, but how can we interpret it? And how can we actually understand something about our original questions, which are, you know, 
related to what are the main sources of variation within this particular data and how are different individuals or the variants across these individuals actually encoded within this network. So to do that, we created a bi-directional approach for being able to probe the, this sort of generative model. And uh, um, this approach is very general, so it could be used in many different architectures, um, but we used it in this particular VAE model that I, that I described. So what's great is this is a neuroscience audience, so you know what I mean by receptive fields. <laughs> I, actually, a lot of machine learning people do as well. Um, but we sort of borrow this terminology here to think about how we can probe the latent space of this generative model. So on one hand, we can ask questions about how perturbations within the input image space give rise to changes in the activations or latent space of this model. So that's this sort of idea shown here on the left of uh, mapping the receptive fields of these units. And then on the right, I'm showing the example of now asking how changes within the latent space now give rise to outputs or changes in the generated outputs. And we can call that our the sort of projective field of a given unit. So hopefully this idea is clear at a high level. So first, we can try to ask questions about the projective field. So if you start changing um, the latent variables within, uh, or each variable within the latent space, you can generate a different output image, right? And so what I'm showing here is for a factor, if we now basically interpolate that variable over the latent space and now generate many images, and we can do that for each of our different factors to essentially understand what each of these variables are encoding for within the model. Uh, oh, sorry. Emma, yeah, 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 go ahead. A question came up and then I might be useful to answer now. Yeah. It's when you use the VAE to generate different brains, do you have any intuition about what features actually encode the it's called patient identity? Ah, yes. So let me just like, let me go through this next part. And then I'll try to, to I'll try to talk a little bit more about that. We haven't actually analyzed, you know, reprojecting this back onto individual brains, but we can look at sort of what are the main patterns of variance that the model is capturing across many individuals. Um, but yeah, that that question is a really good one. I think that's uh, a good next step. So this is now just showing if we look at this latent space interpolation, look at all these images that have been generated, and then all we're doing is for a given factor, we're gonna collapse that and then look at the variance in, in pixel space. So essentially what I'm showing here um, highlighted with factor three in the model is basically looking at which regions of the brain are being highlighted as we move through this latent variable. And I'll say that we haven't given it any information about brain regions, right? Um, these are just the areas of the brain that are, um, that are varying in terms of their autofluorescence signal in this case. And so this, this factor in particular, right, has highlighted regions in the barrel fields um, within hippocampus and also some deep brain structures. And we can see that the different factors are encoding different parts or different brain regions, some of them more localized than others. And the colors here are just sort of showing um, different extrema or whether or not something is in uh, the sort of mean of this latent variable. And so those are all color coded. So kind of what I'm showing here, say in F2, you see this bright blue and bright yellow spot. And um, those are in the extrema or very low probability events within this factor. And those then map on to these sort of viral tracing experiments and where those artifacts are coming from. So what we've found thus far is that artifacts are being mapped into the tails of these distributions. And when we generate samples that are more probable, we're seeing structures and their variants as sort of um, more meaningful and more aligned with the, with the biologies and brain regions of interest. 
So I know I'm running out of time here. Um, we can also map receptive fields. So in this case, what we do is we will mask certain parts of the region of interest. So in this case, we have to know where brain regions are in order to try to map out the receptive fields. And then we can just look at whether or not the latent variable actually changes in response to these perturbations. And then we've measured that in terms of, you know, how much that variable changes. And we can start to then look at how different latent factors impact specific brain regions of interest. All right. So um, with that, I will conclude. Um, I'll just summarize. So in the first part of the talk, I talk, I discussed this idea of learning variability at a micro scale. We, I, I discussed this idea this method called deep brain disco to extract and factorize network representations, code visualizations, and data sets have, um, ha are provided, and here are links to them. In the second part, I talked about learning variability at this macro scale or across individuals, and um, we applied this to about 1,700 different brains that span the mouse connectivity atlas and provide code and visualizations here. All right, so I'd just like to acknowledge the folks in my lab that made this happen. Um, Aish worked on the, the first, the, the work in the first part. Um, Ron's work was highlighted in the second, and, and Joe also has worked on this x-ray um, multitask learning. Um, and then also acknowledge our collaborators at the Allen Institute, so Julie Harris and Jen Whitesell, um, who helped with um, all the second model that I described. And um, our collaborators also, Judy Prasad and at APL, um, for their help with all of the x ray um, data set access and, and, and collection as well. And with that, I will go ahead and take any questions. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Um, you know, maybe one first question related, a, a bit related to the one that was posed before, is that you have used just a red channel. Uh, what are your thoughts on once you see a uh, uh, something changing in the red channel, going back and see if uh, the connectivity is actually unaffected or the, if the connectivity is, 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 it kind of follows, follows that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so, um, you know, the, the reason why we, you know, went with this particular um, data set and using the red channel in this case is that we could have a lot of data that has you know, mostly the same structure, but then we could find, you know, individual differences therein, right? And all these brains have been mapped to a common template. And so um, most most of the structure is actually common, right? Um, whereas in the connectivity experiments, um, the concern was that even if you had the same pathway, which is, um, you know, very improbable just because it also has to do with kind of um, the specific location and all these things, right? You wouldn't have enough examples of what's changing within a given pathway to maybe run the same analysis. Um, but, but with that being said, like the same ideas could be readily applied to many different types of data. So you could imagine, um, you know, learning this model over the autofluorescence and then because we have information across both channels, perhaps, um, yeah, bringing in that connectivity information and seeing how that might, um, you know, impact, say, downstream areas that we're not visualizing in this case, right? Um, maybe brains that have increased autofluorescence within hippocampus might have stronger connections to some other downstream region, for instance. So, um, yeah, that's a really cool idea. Um, and I think the framework allows such analyses to be um, implemented and tried. So, and, and w one other question is that uh, I wonder what is, are your thoughts on applying the same kind of methods that you presented on the first part with the micro CT data, but instead of using images, using the the data sets from transcriptomics, like the ones that Basilica presented uh, early early today, and then you know make make that that jump from 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 data to and jumping over the abstraction from data to some kind of clusters and then and then coming back and see if we find we find new abstractions based on, on, on yeah i mean that's a really cool idea um 
So, I mean, I know that a lot of the work um, that folks are doing at the Allen um, related to transcriptomics has, you know, many different types of features. Um, well, transcriptomics and, and beyond, right, in, in order to learn about cell types. So, I mean, certainly the ideas that I described, right, and you could envision feeding in this information about different cell types, right, teaching the network to then discriminate across, um, across these, you know, different types of cells as labeled, perhaps. Um, or giving it some weak information that can help it to discriminate, right? And then as, as I described, I think um, using a neural network as a feature extractor could be, you know, widely applicable. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I know that there are questions, for instance, within cell types about sort of state transitions or changes from this prototypical transcriptomic profile and, you know, having some amount of wiggle room, right? Um, as, as, as cells are changing perhaps across different cycles. And so you could envision looking at these features formed within this neural network in a, in a similar way as what I described and, and seeing perhaps those state transitions. So that could, be a, that could be a cool way of using this idea, but in a very different type of data set. Okay, well, thanks so much, Eva, and thanks so much for all the other speakers. Um, we we'll, we I think we're 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 done for for today, but uh, we'll be back tomorrow with Saskia, uh, Saskia sharing the session again again, uh, still very much on 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 cell types, but uh, but in but continuing this idea that's that started on the second half of today of 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 of, 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 of structure and and anatomy and also connectivity both at synapse physiology and at uh, and at the um, TM level. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.